Hello folks, we are here with Amber King. This is a video I've been looking forward to doing for quite some time. Well, since he messaged me anyway. First things first, mate. Uh, what kind of tea are you drinking? It's actually green tea. Oh, I'm trying to uh, oh. drink healthier. I have I had a problem with um, way too many coffees. So this is my green tea in between a coffee style uh, thing. It's not very good, I won't lie. How many like coffees a day are we talking when you're doing scripts? Uh, not that bad, like maybe three or four, but now it's down to like one or two. So, okay. you know, we, 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 we getting healthier <laughs> in 2024. Usually I do like, uh, you know, where are you from? What kind of a channel do you have? But considering like, your channel's a lot larger than mine, I'd feel a bit silly doing that, but why don't we do it anyway? So who are you, where are you from? What do you do on your channel? I am Hal, I UK, UK brother down in uh, South. I'll just say that just because I don't mm -hmm. want you people at my door. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I run the Amber King channel, just me though, um, and started, a f I don't remember exactly when, but a few years ago, I used to do other jobs, but then I wanted to, I didn't have anyone in my life to kind of talk about Warhammer lore with. I was like the only person who uh, was really into it. I first kind of interacted with the hobby with um, Battle of McCrag when I was younger, and I very much didn't know what's going on. But I enjoyed the models. I kept. I used to like beg my parents to take me to the uh, local GW store, and I was really like, "Oh my god, these are so cool!" I remember the first like Codex I bought? I still remember like the cover art of it and everything. It was, was amazing. It? I was. I think it was just normal space range one, and this was obviously okay. Battle McCrag. Is that fourth or fifth? Possibly? I think it's I can't fifth, sixth, it maybe sixth? fifth. Um, I can't remember my head, but it, it was a while ago. And then I kind of didn't really interact with the Warhammer for quite a while until mm -hmm. I went to university, and then I picked it up again, and I got really into Warhammer lore. I've always been into various different types of lore from. So if you think about lore from most video games or sci-fi or fantasy universes, I probably have some knowledge in, in in it and um i very much was drawn more to warhammer just because it just seemed i again like you just you can look at some of warhammer art and some of the stories and you just go like oh my god like, you know what i mean it is just seems evocative. yeah I, I really i love warhammer so much um mm -hmm. it's amazing and i didn't have anyone to talk to about it. i used to listen to other youtubers when i was walking around like london doing my then job and i'd Benji thought, you know what? I really want to like give it a go. I think shout out to particularly uh, Wolf Lord Row at the time, just because that was my oh, yeah. like. I listened to someone who's really passionate about the Warhammer lore, particularly from the actual, not just like codexes, but like the actual books. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh man, I'm, you know, my my brother in Christ. There's someone else who is also <laughs> into it. And yeah, then I just sort of gave it a go. I didn't know what I was doing. I have no background experience in doing anything YouTube. Um, but I just wanted to talk about Warhammer and then the Amber King channel kind of slowly evolved into what it is now in which it's a mix of um, delving through specific characters because often in Warhammer books, particularly Horror Terracy, certain characters are spread throughout so many novels and it's actually, I'm sure you've seen that, I've, I actually saw you with um, the Outer Exiles, uh, looking at the chart of Horror Terracy and oh God. following the amount of law Ugh. books in terms of like the right order it's very difficult mm. so i particularly thought i just want like it, the channel kind of evolved in talking about characters because character story mostly interests me i mean mm -hmm. what, your particular about obviously i'm sure your audience already knows your story but in warhammer law which parts do you feel more drawn to are you more like overarching storylines battle or is it more like i think some people they have like they just like the idea of things we had a kit bash with their armies or yeah I, I i think so i've said it before so i'm not just saying this because you're here you are my favorite law youtube channel right oh but too sweet <laughs> i i think you can guess where i am through what you do and that's characters i i'm i'm well into characters that's what what i'm i'm into the human part of astartes like like what what drives them what makes them different what makes them interesting i don't I don't find ultramarines interesting, not because they're bland, but because they are super soldiers, right? This is the the Greco-Roman super soldier in space, and that's cool. But I want the flawed people. I want the people who are, oh, definitely. you know, that they they have another side to them. You know, there may be a traitor, but what if, you know? And that's what I like to do. That's that's what I'm drawn to. And um, 
that's what drew me to your channel. And at the end of the day, it was it was yeah, really 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 cool. Um, I guess the uh, especially heavily flawed Argyle Tal, wasn't it? Yeah, or... exactly. Yeah, I, I mean Argyle Tal is probably my favourite Horus Heresy character now. I think he's up there anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I've not been. I. It's one of the main reasons why you know screw Erebus with, with every fibre of my being. Like, I can't really stand the guy. But again, I, I was. Okay, we'll get into this a little bit later on because I think the first question I'm going to ask you is related to it. But I was okay. Uh, spoilers for End and the Death, by the way. Have you read it yet? Do you know? I have. Okay, good. Everyone, spoilers for End and the Death, Volume 3, all right? Okay. So Erebus kills Garviel Loken. That was the moment I was like, okay, seriously? I've had enough of this guy now. Like, every. every It's like Dan Abbott's gone. What good characters are there that people actually like? Well, Erebus can kill that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Yeah, it would have been a lot more. I saw a lot more potential in keeping Loken alive and seeing where he went after that in the scouring than actually killing him off to make sure Samus comes about. Anyway, anyway, on that subject, all right, first question, mm -hmm. all right, are there any 40 char 40k characters you will never cover on your channel from sheer dislike of them? Or that you'd be hesitant, hesitant to do um... that? It's this difficult question in terms of, like, you mentioned Erebus. Disliking a character for one... Erebus is actually a well-written character. Is, yeah. And you dislike him so much because he is well-written. Yeah. The only reason, particularly, again, from my perspective, I wouldn't cover a character is if I felt that there was no... There's not enough depth to the character. Because there's plenty of characters who have tons of lore written about them. But I just don't find them interesting or unique. I guess dislike of the character would actually... Would I? It was more of like, am I apathetic to the character? Mm -hmm. So, I think a particularly, this is a strange thing here. Where like in 40k lore, maybe sort of around the time just before necessarily Horus Heresy arrived, there is an era of like what's particularly like the height of what was like more like the grim dark style writing. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, within that time period, there's quite a few books in there which I would describe as aggressively mid, like um. Like, I want to cover the character Uriel Ventress at some point, I did think. Yeah. But then, I definitely have read quite a lot of Uriel Ventress, and oh my god, I, he's not even the main character in some of his own books. He's basically Mad Max. Yeah, he, he's, yeah, he's but then, you know, it's named after him, but he's not really the main character. But then it's also a funny thing of, like, his series also contains perhaps the most grimdark book there's ever been written about Warhammer. So, it's a strange trade-off. I think, I would say at the moment... Funny enough, I will. I'm going to out myself here. I would probably really, I really don't want to cover Vulcan as a character. I see that. You, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And the yeah. reason I don't want to cover Vulcan, I will probably do it one day and I'll give it my all. But the reason I don't want to cover Vulcan as a character, because I don't think he really has character flaws. He just goes through difficult stuff, particularly mm -hmm. like with Conrad Curzon. I don't really see Vulcan as a deeply... He's written to be too much of a goody two-shoes, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, it's like, like they've almost... listened to the memes and gone, let's let's just lean into that, you know, let's go into it and, and do that, you know what I mean, rather than... I, I like Vulcan from, like, the meme perspective, like, mm -hmm. you know, TTF, like, give me a yeah. hug and yeah, all sure. that stuff. But then, but again, it's just, it's surface level, and I just, it's one of those things, I guess, I don't have a massive love of the salamander novels as well they, mm -hmm. they don't have enough they feel a bit more space ring going to point a and b rather than an internal you mean um, old arc. earth and um those i mean like like you ones particularly written by nick Kime don't yeah. seem to resonate with yeah. me um but that's i guess i say that vulcan pro probably number one you'll ventures at the moment mm -hmm. but i maybe i got a little bit more reading to do on that to see if there's like points of interest i can pick out I, I think that's kind of where the strength of a channel like pancreas no work comes from because he can literally mm. cover anything because of the satire slant he has do you know what i mean where he, he talks to you like you're, you're in a bar with him and he's explaining it to you so yeah, i think i think colin yeah because i know colin quite well um yeah pancreas no work as a glorious channel which i yeah, hope to, yeah. i hope to god one day is more of like the face of what because it, it encompasses perfectly what it, it's just ridiculous what warhammer is it's utterly ridiculous yeah. <laughs> yeah. and um i just think he he 
brings that across so much. I was trying to describe Warhammer. Like, I don't do it very well. As you can probably guess from me, I talk way too much. But I was trying to do it um, succinctly. And I was like, it's tragedy. It's, um, yeah, like, tragedy is grimdark. And yet it's utterly badass as well. And yeah. then there's a slight, there's a slight hit of comedy as well. Because, um, yeah. Yeah, and he just he really brings that over to people. I'm a big Colin's a great lad, and uh, he makes great uh, Warhammer content. The thing about his channel is, and we'll start like kissing his ass in a minute. But the thing about his channel <laughs> is that, um, yeah. like, when I was in the states, uh, my mother-in-law at the time asked me, you know, what what are you doing with these little toy soldiers? And I was like, well, oh, hold your hold your horses there, sweetheart. Oh, no, no. Hold your horses there, sweetheart. Let me just explain what these are. So I explained. And she goes, oh, well, well, what about the settings? What, what, what does it do? And I was like, um, huh. how do I explain this kind of, you know, Reich-ish institution to somebody who's devoutly Jewish? Uh, yeah, and and it just, yeah. you know, it, it just didn't come across. <laughs> but like, pound kiss, no work. I could literally say to her if I knew him at the time, go watch this one video and he will explain it far better than I can. And in a way, that's not, filled with flowery um prose because i know i think you'll even admit your channel i would say is for beginners if you already have a vested interest in a certain character or theme then yeah dude go and watch amp king's channel you'll be there for hours just devouring the entire thing but if you're literally go what is this warhammer thing it's all stupid pancreas no work like he will literally lay it out for you in a way that you can understand and he will take the piss out of it with you he'll be like yeah it's, it's silly but I love it, you know. It, I just can't. There's no higher praise Absolutely. I can give than that. Um, all right, all right. I want to jump into another question because I'm really, really curious about some of these. Um, so, Go for it. Go for it. what 40k army do you think is the most difficult to be into right now? And what I mean by that is, which army gives you the most grief from other hobbyists whilst being totally undeserved? Undeserved. Yeah. Um, I have. I will admit to an undeserved dislike, strong dislike of League of Votan. Why? And I will explain it in the fact that, first of all, I believe the Leagues of Votan are, from a law perspective, utterly lazy. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, like, I don't, like, I think the mod, as in, like, if I looked at it from, like, a modeling perspective, I'm like, that's a clean model. I actually like some of the vehicles. They're quite nice. But in terms of, like, the Warhammer 40k verse, it almost feels like it doesn't quite fit in. I would say it's difficult in terms of like, and it's undeserved because it's not like they've done anything to necessarily warrant my dislike of him. Yeah. But I just think it was such a, like if someone asked me at the end of, was it like ninth? Was it during ninth? What new army really needs to be in Warhammer? Mm. I'm not sure if you polled a hundred people, they would seriously answer Leagues of Votan. They would go like, you know what? I'm really, really in the mood for leagues of votan i'm not sure and not to disrespect anyone who does collect the models because obviously they are some nice models but i, I think for particularly myself as well i was talking with um uh, if you know arthur bones who's another channel yeah he's a big fan of it because and most of their love comes from other franchises which is again not fair to warhammer it's because it's on brand 40k and, yeah yeah but like rock and stone or all that stuff you know mm -hmm. and dwarves and again it's I just think they're utterly lazy, and I I can't, for the life of me, bring myself from a law perspective to be interested in them. Like, there's a new mm. book coming out for Leagues of Otan, and I thought to myself, is there going to be anything in that book which I'm really excited about? And I was yeah. like, no, there isn't. Um, I think, particularly, it doesn't really hit the grittiness of Warhammer enough. I think they're a bit too generic sci-fi, which... Again, it's a bit more of like a current theme in Warhammer. It's a bit too... It wants to be recognisable to a lot of other people. Yeah. But I think Leagues of Votan... And again, like, I don't think it deserves... Like, I just generally dislike them, but... I don't know if you can really hate them that much. They're all right. But again, they also, they're half a range. They feel like someone was like, why don't we just do that? And then other people went, oh, all right. It was, and there's so many other things that are just so much more interesting in the Warhammer verse, like um, Dark Mechanicum. How is that not a thing? Yeah, Eldar Corsairs. Corsairs. Yeah. Um, what's other Eldar? Um, 
the Eldar who live on the Ex Ex Exodites. Exodites like, yeah, yeah. Like there were so many other things which could have been such a win, particularly with Exodites. That brings over people who recognizably like, you know, if it's an aspect of like Wood Elves or what was already in the range of like Age of Sigmar, Eisenerth was like an Undersea. Thing. You know, there's so many other mm. things they had which I felt should have been much higher priority. And I'd much rather had other rangers be padded out than a new army that doesn't... I don't think it has... This This new book coming up is the only law book to it. Mm. I mean, poor Eldar fans out there, they already have a few as well. But I, again, like that was just feels like a massive waste of what was, you know, this rich universe. And I don't think I'm drawn to them. Do, do you not Sorry, think that... Um, no, 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 no. That's the whole point, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point. Do, do, do you not, um, <laughs> these are jumping off points. Um... I think you answered your own question there when you said, you know, why are they there, is that whenever I ask somebody about Leagues of OTAN, if they got into them, they always tell me the models are cool, and then they stop. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they're they like, oh yeah, the models are really cool, I love them. And I'm, to be fair, this is a tabletop war game. If you like the models, that's as good enough a reason to do them as any other. But like, there is no latching on point. There is no... I, I, I know of, like, maybe Wes Hammer has touched on them. That's because he really does do a deep dive into... He'll take one sentence and make, like, a half an hour video about it. Do you know what I mean? Like, kind of a thing. No, Nobody mm. else is touching them because there isn't anything else to touch off of. Um, I, I couldn't make any any videos for my channel because there's no character law. They're like, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's no depth to them at this point. I mean, we have... Um, it may change. May change. Uh, my my answer to the question was actually Grey Knights when I thought about it because one I love Grey Knights but also like the part of it where it said you know what it, you get a lot of grief that's totally undeserved. We are still living in the aftermath of that Demon Hunters Codex. People still think the Grey Knights are <laughs> like that, and it's like you know, and it doesn't matter how many times Games Workshop slaps us down in the law and has some space wolf randomly killing nine of us out of nowhere. That you know, people still think, oh, they're so overpowered in the law. No, they're not. Like, it's totally unreasonable. Like, no, we're not. Every single book we're in, we're getting our shit pushed in by everybody, even all the psychers. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, that was my response to it. I was like, yeah, that's not deserved. Um, that and we've got really old models now as well, so I've got to make them Primoris oh. myself. Thank you very much, Games Workshop. Um, alrighty, so. Uh, what do you think about the current state of 10th edition, and would you ever consider taking the lore of 40k and moving to another system for the gaming side of the hobby? This is a very interesting question because I have quite a few, I'm sure many people have mixed feelings about it. From, I'll just start with what is perhaps the objective of, of 10th edition. One of 40k, gen, like, say we're at 9th edition, it's quite difficult to turn that customer into someone who's a player necessarily because I would I properly started to learn how to play Warhammer uh, in ninth edition and I'm not gonna lie it was hard I just from like from complete newbie to also playing with people who are yeah, other newbies as ninth well. Ninth is not the one to start with. Though. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> but like again, like that's where yeah. you, like more people have come into the hobby than you. Like I and the last two editions have more people, or even eight, I'd say, more people come in in these three editions than possibly for a long time. And it was incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to play. Lots of model releases are very nice, but I struggled a lot. Um, tenth edition comes around, and I have turned perhaps my like friend group slash gaming group from about two people into maybe nearly even up to like nearly ten people. That's cool with tenth edition. Because of the fact that, first of all, Warhammer, like, everyone has to admit, like, other like, than possibly knowing Warhammer for quite a while, you don't really, like, you, sometimes you forget how hard it is to just get, like, you know, start that game. Because it's not quite like, either, it's not like, it's not quite like d d It's not quite like, yeah. if you ever had to describe it, it's like your grandma. It's like, it's like chess, but more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the one I've had to do. Um, so I think 10th edition has done... Like, to speak on the positive, because obviously I don't want to be fully negative about it. The most positive thing it's done is it's brought so many more people into playing Warhammer 40k, which is a which is a good thing for us, because first of all, uh, again, like m more people involved in the hobby means more playtime for people who are actually already there. It means that like, you, you go see people, you get outside more, you visit your friends more, because there's an excuse. 
Like Warhammer is so good at getting you to still meet up with your friends, particularly if you're getting yeah. maybe if you're post uni. A lot of the people who are listening, you know, it's a thing to get people, um, you know, face to face and doing something. Um, and tenth edition has particularly again like it's slimmed down a lot of things. I think my friend from Deadlands of the Dark Gods, Eli, he mentioned maybe the thing they could fix with it is like cost for war gear again. I don't know, but I think it's done such a good job of like I love playing my world eaters and my thousand sons i have so much fun mm -hmm. playing with them not gonna lie because uh either one of them is like magic like ball or the other one is like i am already in this man's guts <laughs> <turn one. laughs> yeah, yeah. so um and particularly like if i play world eaters the newer models that at the end of ninth they were gorgeous i won't lie liked them quite a lot so um i would i've felt particularly like i've had lots of fun in playing 10th as well i think it gets to a slight problem in the hobby where we're getting more towards it we'll say like we're halfway through 10th edition aren't we right now yeah and about that yeah the whole the slight problem with it is that with its simplification it becomes lack of depth and when we're this far in and we've all probably played quite a few games we are realizing particularly for armies that don't even have their codex yet they're they're realizing there's oh wait i maybe am not getting as much out of it as i could in previous editions or if it's a newer player they're like i've kind of done that thing a lot and i already know my army so well because mm. again there's not as much to it so i i know uh, um I, sorry mate. Okay, good. Uh, i i know the um so i was actually caught in this when i was working games workshop um, so at the end of seventh edition, so 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 the the actual edition cycle started to really pick up in terms of what they were planning to do with them, time frame wise, at the end of seventh. So at least that's what we were told. And then they, they brought out the Imperial Agents Codex, and they were to they told us really sell the shit out of this. It's going to be really cool. You know, finally we're going to get to have Inquisitors and all these henchmen and stuff. And I was like, great, cool, brilliant. Sold it to like four or five people who then bought armies, and then two months later, bang, eighth edition re uh, announced. And one of the what, what codex is not going to bring out first? Well, it's not going to be Imperial Agents. So they were like, "We want our money back because we're not going to get to play this game in your store." So, and then I had to say, "Well, actually, about gaming in stores, um, <laughs> we're not doing that anymore." Uh, so yeah, I, I I see what you're what you're saying in, in that the the actual. Um, the, the pace is picking up, and a lot of people aren't going to get their their time in the sun, so to speak, in terms of what they're doing. Um, I honestly believe that they should really slow down this uh, tick over of editions, and I was really hoping tenth would be the definitive. Okay, this is what we're doing for the next eight or nine years. You know, this is the the the, the unity engine of Warhammer Forty Thousand. We're going to build on top of this for free, but this is what we're doing now. You need to pay for this book. I would have minded that if they just said, no, 35 quid for the book, no problem. You know, and then from there, we'll all of the rules updates are now free. You can get you can download your, your app, whatever it needs to be. After the next eight, nine years, we're doing this. And you will you will get to at least have your codex for a couple of years. Right now, you know, can you see where the trust is going? Like, because to me, a lot of people are saying, why would I bother starting my army if their codex isn't out yet? Because I know they're not going to be around for very long. Oh, definitely. Like, I... I do i would say one thing in their slight positive which i have used quite a lot which is obviously the the new newer like index cards like i still use the index cards for my thousand suns yeah. and uh, my world eaters that's again like that's tied me over for a little while and i definitely appreciate that it's you know what i mean like my army's playable i i think maybe i've got lucked out and i picked more interesting armies because if i played other ones i we know they're not as fun um but like particularly for world eaters and thousand suns I feel like I've, you know, I have two armies, so maybe I get the luxury of like flicking between, you know, if I don't like this one this time oh, around, yeah. I get the bonus of doing something else completely on the opposite end of Playstar. Mm. Um, so the index cards have helped me go along, but I, I can like, I think of particularly with like World Eaters, I'm glad I didn't buy them in night because obviously that would have been a, you know, Awkward. disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Awkward. I never think they need, I, I do suspect particularly with like, if there is like 11th edition coming around in like a few years time the way that they've 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 got this new customer base from 10th edition and i think again with the launch of like space marine 2 and other 
things in the show and all of these other medias coming in with that influx of new people possibly joining the hobby they may want to keep things pretty unified and simple i don't imagine mm. it'll be a massive change like what ninth to tenth is mm. i suspect they'll keep it quite similar i think i do agree like they need to get codexes like i would be okay with subscribing to like a games workshop thing as like a yearly or monthly rate but it had everything in it yeah like I, I was saying to my friend i think if we're halfway through the edition if it's for people who have codexes they know we're going to come out in the latter half i think give them another detachment that's through indexes like i said like if i knew like let's just say my beloved thousand sons are like not going to come until like even way to the end of the edition give me another like because the index detachments are free uh if you download them online i just said give me another free index one so then i've got another thing to keep me going for as long as i've been going so far and i think that would again because that doesn't really necessarily cost them too much they can also if they want debut a few things they want to test out or they can refer back to older stuff they've done in previous codexes where they thought that was cool ideas mm. it's just a way to like get Again, you want your customer base to like, like I think from think about it from GW perspective, you want people to keep buying your plastic crack, and the way they're going to do that is if it's exciting and interesting. If like, I think for my thousand sons, there's rumors, isn't it, about like possibly chaos having, um, they might do integrating like demons into their detachment, and I like the idea of that. If I just got a detachment, say at Christmas time this year, which mm. says Hey, you know you already play that detachment you like, which is like you know, it's really you know the cabalistic rituals. We've got another one for you, and it's more demon focused. You could choose between the ones you like, and then I've got an excuse to go be like, they're like, so I can go buy demon models which are cheaper in some regards, expensive if it's Nurgle ones. Oh my god, beast of Nurgle. Um, <laughs> but I've got an idea of like, you know, what I mean, like if I'm not gonna buy another full army, which they maybe wish to encourage me to do, yeah. Um, I've got an incentive to be like, you know what, for the next year, I'm not buying loads of models, but I may pick up a few cheeky things because I want to try out something new with my, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's like the argument, like when they're going to release chess 2.0. Um, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I want, I definitely want them to realize like, as much, I know it's difficult. There, there may be problems because it's difficult for balance and uh, particularly for the game now, I imagine, like, I don't, I would never want the task of having to balance Warhammer 40k because it seems like an absolute nightmare. You just throw in it terms out. of like, you just well, again, like, throw also, it out. balancing could be easier, like you said, with like with online um, rules because, mm. well, first of all, everyone brings their phone to the thing anyway. Mm. If I've been, in, I've been in smaller tour like friend tournaments and things like that. Everyone's got their phone. No one's using the books really. Um, It'd be so much easier because then you can actually make you don't necessarily have to fix things by point cost. You can fix things like with like with Grey Knights, isn't it? This edition. So as of time of recording, they had to. Is it what's the? Is it Nemesis Knight? The um, yeah, the Stomper. Yeah, the, the little baby baby yeah, carrier. Baby one. carrier. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's just go with that. Yeah. They had to fix that one with a slight rules change to make so, the yeah, melee that. weapon stronger, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, the Demon Hammer they made. Stronger? The Nemesis Demon Hammer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so they 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 obviously and then poor thing is they have to rewrite the index cards mm -hmm. if they print them out. But if it's all online, then that's just a way easy being like, hey, listen, your thing is already changed for you. You don't have to, you know what I mean? Like it just saves everyone a hell of a lot of headache, and it makes their on their end things so much easier to balance because I think particularly like the balance of the game, relatively speaking, at the moment. Oh my god, the start of the edition was health <laughs> for yeah, uh, yeah. playing against like, Eldar and all that stuff. Yeah. Relatively now, like I've played quite a few games recently, and even in the games I've lost, it's been incredibly close. I've never felt like I've stomped or been stomped. Well I I, um, I think I think of did you watch um Orspex Tactics? Because he has a yeah, few yeah, yeah. really good videos on like the percentages of uh, yeah, of tournament wins and, and tournament or actually wins at tournaments not just winning the whole thing but how many you know games armies are winning even the ones at the low end like death watch are still get they're still winning about 46 percent of their games so the actual percentage swing to the strongest army to the lowest army is isn't far like like 40k to me the, the issue with 40k isn't that it's, it's not balanced um it's, it's not a very well made game that's that's my issue. Like I'm I'm not I'm not. A, oh yeah, I mean you know like, I, I can understand it from yeah. that perspective in terms of 
I think particularly thing like again like when like with rules as well particularly yeah like when I've played in some recent tournament things like the rule stuff has been like we just oh like you know like when you're trying to have a discussion with someone about it and you actually have to get like other people involved because oh, you're like yeah, oh my god so much money it. yeah yeah the whole thing grinds to a halt it's like it's like the UN like I'm trying to play some with toy soldiers man there's just like I just um I I made the switch to OPR one page rules mm -hmm. and um i just never look back i'm just I'm, I'm getting three or four games in a session and i'm having a lot of fun um three or four games in a session damn yeah <laughs> yeah if, if, I, if i'm at the store for four or five hours i'm getting like three games in and you know God, and damn. you can you can play at half a campaign in like a week a, a day you know like if you're there all day and after every game i'm not drained i'm not like oh my fucking god don't talk to me about Space Marines. I don't want to know about anything about 40k. I'm going home. I'm going to boil my head, right? That's after one <laughs> game of 40k. I'm done, you know? Um, I don't know how tournament players do it. Like, they are superhuman. Like, the way that they're... Um, or heavily autistic, as a lot of my friends are who go to these events, who are, who are able to remember so many different things all at once and, and go for it. Um, it's not an insult, by the way. That's an incredible skill. But um, that's not me. <laughs> like, I'll go there and just be like, oh, yeah, I'm done. I've uh, played one game of this. Um, I just about won. I'm sweating. I I feel like I want to. I, I I'm done. Um, whereas with OPR, I've been able to actually get in there and actually have really close games, as you said. I mean, close games aren't really the issue in 40k. I would say this is actually one of the best balanced 40k editions that they've done, and especially mm. you know from the swings that we saw towards the end of seventh edition with those fucking formations that would cause so many headaches in my store with people ranting and raving at each other because the, the formations were so overpowered. Um, to, to nowadays, where you've actually got a really tight swing between the, the top armies, like your Grey Knights now, are actually quite strong, and if you know how to use them, and the Death Watch, you know, you can actually have a good trade-off there. Um, it's just, to me, I'm going to get into alternating activations. Um, having played a game with alternating activations, the game flows quicker, and you're not making plans... 40 minutes ahead of time you're reacting and pushing the other person at the same time it actually feels like you're, you're fighting a battle rather than okay um how you do all of your models and i'll do all of my models you know I, and i i've just noticed that even even in when you're playing guys who know the rules at the back of their hand the game drags because you're looking at what the other person's doing and you're making plans accordingly and then those plans have to go out the window and using more and more time to to adjudicate what you're doing whereas in a alternating activation game you're always on the go you're always stimulated you're always there and it's not really for people with low attention spans i've heard the argument for me it just, i've got quite a long attention span it just it just makes for a better game i feel like i'm engaged i feel like a general who's having things happen mm. to him and going oh my god this tyranid's broken through that wall oh my god what am i gonna do um and maybe I, i'm gonna plug the gap with these marines go on i know they're gonna die but Buy me some time, lads, go on. And you feel like you're in a movie. Whereas with 40k, you feel like you're playing a war game. Do you know what I mean? I think with... Um, oh, definitely. I think... It's just one of the things where, like, if they... If GW wants to approach it that way, they can probably definitely see the benefits of it. Where in terms of, like, player enjoyment in the game means mm -hmm. that people invest in it more, which means they spend more time in it, which means, from their perspective, you people buy more stuff. So I think they are very much incentivized to actually probably they should well i say so they are incentivized they should be incentivized to find a way to no matter what increase players enjoyment to yeah. the like the utmost extent because again i think i like i mentioned like the struggles of getting people to actually play warhammer and having like when you play warhammer you actually have to guide it, you usually need to guide someone through it to actually play it like the first time it's quite yeah. a lot um but i think if it was much more like what you said like it's a bit more it would be a lot easier to even teach someone the game because it's just very much like see it's actually happening in real time step by step and then someone didn't have to it makes a difference obviously like in terms of strategy that maybe takes some things away but I, again like but then the meta would change and then and people make up new stuff i think it'll be it'll be much more digestible like you said faster mm -hmm. much better pace it'll be interesting to see if they consider it i don't know what i don't think they again, will I just don't know what they're thinking. Like in terms, of, like I've got no reason, like what the future of like even like eleventh edition will yeah. be, because it's one of those things where they usually plan years ahead of with stuff. You do. So I assume it's probably already been 
well, you know, the, well, the models I'll, have already been sculpted and all that I, stuff. I've heard that know. argument before about, you know, they plan ahead. Um, the, the truth is, they do, but not with everything. Um, in, Vaguely, in, in, yeah. <laughs> in terms of additions, yes. But in terms of what shall we release for the Blood Angels, like what, what the, the discussion we had before about Blood Angels, that is an ad hoc decision that has just happened. Where they've just gone, ah, uh, I guess we'll just release this. You know, and that happens all the time. Like, I, I know people in the studio that they do that all the time. Or they drop something on them. Like, like Steve Jobs-like, you know. I want this new unit and law. Get on it. And you're like, okay, when do you want it by? Yesterday. Do it. Do it now. We're releasing it in a couple of months. That happens as well. You know what I mean? It's it explains not the, um, explains like what in the most maybe recent few years, the kind of miscommunication between what was like the modeling team, the yeah. law team, and then like the PR team and all that stuff. Because again, yeah. I'm sure like we we discussed before we were recording with most things if it's either it can if you think it can be assigned to maliciousness it's most likely incompetence yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. or human error yeah. so i think a lot of things particularly um like gw i mean obviously if you want to go into it, like gw controversies go for i it, yeah. i somewhat think and have somewhat heard that a lot of things that they decisions that have not gone down well has been made and they've been like we did not green light that why does someone do that now we have to stick with it so mm -hmm. i which i find utterly hilarious because it's for a company that big in terms of like people are watching you constantly for information and releases this is not like a movie studio where it's like we're waiting for the final product mm. but wait like there's a there's a reason why they just recently updated the community websites because the news aspect of it is so important and I just find it funny how perhaps like so many of their disasters have just has actually just been human error so, uh, but then some of the other ones have been much more of like i think they are lost in certain uh directions so they're, just, they're, all, they're big topics though so just know. um jumping off of that like one of my trainers doug an actual nice trainer i mean i know it's amazing um <laughs> but like uh he <laughs> When we were having a, having a drink once, he, he said to me, um, I, I said, like, because I, I can't remember what had happened, but I was getting lambasted. I think I was getting, like, um, you know, a load of stores in the area were getting hounded because we weren't allowing certain Forge World products in the store. Um, quite mm. rightly so as well. Some of them, like, Titans and things like that. And you know, I've got a 4x4 four four table, man. Go swivel. Um, but, like, he was like, listen, don't get too frustrated with Games Workshop because what you need to realize is this was never meant to be a big company. And I said, well, I said, well, what, what does that even mean? And he said, Games Workshop is McDonald's that's still being run like a mar and pop corner shop deli. That's what it is. It, oh it, yeah, I, you they know. are wholly unequipped, I think, for the yeah. amount of interest in their product. It's not malicious most of the time. They just everything's lost in translation. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing a lot of the time. It is a company of nerds who are in an old boys club. And again, uh, that sometimes can be... I hated the cliqueiness of it. It was one of the main things that drove me mad. Like, in my local area, we've got... Um, I'm not going to name him, but we've got um, two or three stores that are run by X Games Workshop. Not just people, but office people, you know? And the Games Workshop attitude is still there. Like, I'll go in and talk to them, and they barely let you get a word in edgeways. They're always using very upbeat language and you know all of the all of the the progressive terms they love throwing those out you know and these are like you know 50 odd year old white dudes like come on mate you know you know you just, i know that's not you stop with the spiel <laughs> and it's like they're still doing it they, they can't switch that off like they just can't switch it off that these are the people who are working there and um was the um was it the term know. is it code switching isn't it it's yeah when you uh yeah behave differently with uh different people yeah I definitely in my jobs have been a bit because I used to do some more customer facing things and oh my you know you put in like, hello everyone how's your day like your customer yeah, yeah. facing voice oh my god I definitely can't switch out of it like I, that I was my issue like I didn't have one I was just like uh, what models do you want? <laughs> what models do you want like, kind of a thing <laughs> you know uh, you like ultramarines cool there's Marnius Caligar there's this da, 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 da. a fancy game yeah I'll play a game with you like I was so I was bollocked so many times of playing games with customers in the store and I was like dude like, if there's nobody else in the store and some little lad comes in who's 14 and wants to have a game of Warhammer, I'm playing him and I'm he's going to win. He's going to have a really good time and he's going to win. You know, like, that's what mm. I'm doing. And and you've now engendered this this hobby to him for the rest of his life. He'll always remember when he beat the manager. Like, he came in on a quiet Tuesday afternoon 
Wednesday afternoon and he beat the manager, you know, and he, and he just, you know, the, the guys in the Liverpool store used to do that with me all the time. Like, I still remember them to this day, like the guys who were in that store, um, you know, doing like, like, um, you know, Warhammer think, campaigns and stuff. It was brilliant. I think of, um, like, there's always like the worst example, which is like Blizzard, where, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> yeah. the, just like the corporate left the corporate thing almost smothered what was like the artisticness mm -hmm. underneath it um again like with games workshop i definitely feel like they were at a very strange precipice moment in the hobby i definitely like obviously since what was essentially 2017 right in like the history of it where Bruce gilliman returns the setting there's a new injection of like we need to turn this it was obviously a new ceo came in like we need to turn this thing into uh you know a machine it needs to be because right you know obviously financial struggles at the time yeah and it was about re-injecting some kind of new thing into the hobby which to be fair it, you know there's different timelines in which that didn't happen and then we yeah, and yeah. me and you are both not here talking about it um yeah so in some some regards thank you <laughs> but also it means that the way to re-inject things is just obviously you know it's like with most things like yes you know, more 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 of it and I think with Warhammer 40k in particular, I think Horus Heresy stays to it quite well. It's like we're all it's like the term of like grimdark, isn't it? Which is kind of a very difficult discussion at this very time because Grimdark is possibly what brought in a lot of people into the hobby. If you ever wanna like really understand, like as in you wanna immediately recognize what the tone of Grimdark is, you just mm. have to listen to some of like, you know. I just descriptions of the universe from like older novels such as like Eisenhorn, which I did recently in my channel, which oh I love Eisenhorn. Fantastic yeah. character, fantastic books. Yeah. Um we'll see the 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 most extreme case is the Uriel Ventress one with the Tomonculaba. Yeah. <laughs> I remember listening to that for the first time and I still like that made me sit up and not sleep for quite a while. That freaked me out so much. Uh, to, to be fair, um, like th that's not the only occasion where they've done stuff like that i remember there was one in, yeah. in uh, so i think it was in saturnine where a lot of the chaos space marines are enclosed in concrete forever oh <laughs> i hate that moment. i was it's like, like oh that's horrible because they're like um, immortal beings you know that are stuck there there's the huron blackheart short story i think where one of his men betrays him so he places him inside this thing behind his throne and he's yeah. tied to um, life yeah. support and he cannot move see hear anything and i just think about that still um but again like that's one of the things where like it sh you know those are the things that brought, like because of how much nothing else is quite as dim as that in a lot of places mm -hmm. you're like like that draws in a lot of interest to the hobby yeah but then i also have read like i said that mentioned way earlier i've read some of the euros ventures books and they are not grimdark i swear to god that thing is like a crime drama thing i don't like yeah. that is so far um i think Eisenhorn's they it's kind of like that as well though isn't it like Eisenhorn's kind of like a um midsummer murder crime thriller but, yeah you know it's 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 40k i think the one of the things like i stumbled upon recently you probably heard of it like you heard of trench crusade have you mm-hmm yeah, yeah, like, that's yeah. one of the things where, like, just, like, if you want an example of, like, a universe which is entirely grimdark and there's mm. nothing else but grimdark, that's one of those things where you look at that, and I find that as a good, like, contrast piece to, like, what it's part relentless. of Warhammer. Yeah. 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 What part of Warhammer is that and what part isn't? Because yeah. I think for a lot of people, like, I do obviously really love a lot of the grimdark stories. I find myself particularly drawn to, like, much more, like, grimdark art styles. I think there's certain artists that GW have employed in the more recent years, which like the Chaos um, Codex cover art, I actually have that as a poster, the one like you know, the massively mm. strong red background. Yeah, that is it. I love it. But then I also have read Infinite and the Divine, and that thing is not grimdark, but it is so funny, and I loved it. Um, I've read. I'm recently doing. Uh, I'm going to be doing Kyphus Kane soon. Kyphus mm. Kane is not really a grim dark story, no, but it's no. but I still really really enjoyed it. It's just set in like grim like there's hints of it, the grim darkness behind it. But I still like I couldn't imagine myself like it, I couldn't imagine those things being taken away from Warhammer because people said like if that's not in the right tone. But I definitely think in the more recent years, I think it's the 
it's not necessarily actually like what's in the novels. It's I'm mostly kind of put off by a lot of um, the art direction in like codexes and book covers recently. Yeah. I think yeah. the Cotier's, um, Cotier's, uh sorry, his uh, codex, obviously the Imperial Agents Codex yeah. one, is that old? They had to change it to the old Grimdark one because they people liked it better. Mm -hmm. But then the new novel by Darius Hinks. Darius Hinks has also written some uh, Mephiston books that I really liked, uh, which are properly grimdark in the tone. Well, they have but to then, be Mephiston. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the the description of like Baal and the Blood Angels, like rituals in those books, mm. amazing. Um, but then the covers, even the more recent one with it, the, is it the Exorcist uh, chapter also got a novel? Yes. I think some of the they clearly have. Some someone is not necessarily on point in terms of art direction in the hobby. I, I think I'm not sure just reasons. one. I mean, I mean, like so. So if we're talking about yeah, the, not like, necessarily one, but as in yeah, someone who makes those decisions. I mean, if we're going on, on the history of, of Games Workshop, so like um, attitudes have changed over time. But I think what people like to do is like they like to make things black and white and binary. So I know Tom Kirby, um, he became general manager I think sometime in like eighty five, eighty six. Um, but he actually was the guy who eventually nearly ran him out of business. So, so it was him and Brian Ansell who mm. were who did a, a leveraged buyout from within in 1991, and that was the start of the end of of um, what's his name, Andy Chambers, who was still there. He, he was there for several years afterwards. But the the end of Rick Priestley, you know, his career at Games yeah. started to fade away from that point as he was kind of pushed to the side. John Blanche, too, kind of pushed to the side. They still did third edition and different things like that, but you could see people say to me, like, oh, it's not really grimdark anymore. And I, and I have to say, dude, it's not been grimdark for about 10, 15 years, really, because that they've moved so far away from... The third edition was... Fuck, that was grim. Like, some, some of the shit that was described in that... Even the Golden Throne, the way that was described was, whoa, okay, you know, I remember my mum reading that and going... What are you reading? <laughs> like, what? What is this? You know. And then when Tom Kirby went away around that 2017, um, we actually had memos to stores saying, "Look, you know, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Kevin um, Roundtree, right? He, he's starting uh, as CEO. There will be a sea change you know, at, our, at our next retail workshop. We'll take you through the changes that are going to be happening, things like that, to managers and stuff. And so when we went, it was all fully discussed that okay." There are certain areas where we're going to be pulling back in terms of the grim darkness and little bits like that. Uh, Rebute Gilliman will be given center stage. That was the first time we found out that he was coming back. It was in well, late late seven, 2017. And it was like, okay, okay, here we go. Right, you know, it's 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 one of those. Um, and it was just one of those where we had, how do I put it? With, with 8th edition, it, it, it was seen as a great reset for what was meant to be 40k. Do you know what I mean? It was going to be this mm. this huge new... Uh, the, the phrase Saturday morning cartoon was mentioned. You know, we, we, we want cartoons. We, we want a wider media to be involved in 40k. And a, a lot of managers were resentful of that and were saying, oh, that's not really what we are. You know, we we walk a tightrope where we sell this really grim, dark product, but we sell it to the masses. That's what we want to do. And that's what the lead belt's all about and things like that. So the lead belt is... Have you ever heard that phrase before, the lead belt in, in Nottingham? I've heard it before. So it's basically it an area of Nottingham or across the, the Midlands where uh, all of the major players in wargaming are global. Like, it, mm. it's really weird. Like, oh, I, so it's Games Workshop, Warlord Games, everybody who's anybody selling products is in that area. Almost globally in that area, the H HQs mm -hmm. are there, and that's called the lead belt because of what they used to make, obviously the the, the miniatures out of. Um, so it's not been grim dark for years. Like I, I don't know where this phrase of 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 oh it's it's turning into, you know, it's turning less and less grim dark. Well, it's not been that for ages, and, and we can continue campaigning for it, and I do because I love grim dark stuff. I mean, Demonculabra, I'm I'm a bit different on that. I I, I'm, I think you touched on it, but that comes across as squick to me um it always for me should know? be i always think like that should always remain the furthest extent of where it's willing to go yeah, uh, just yeah. because i think any more than that and it's uh, i don't know what the word is but it doesn't it's necessarily satire, like it? it's almost like 
you know, yeah. ob obscene. Like, I know um, I, I, I love gaming, and, and I talk about Dragon Age a lot because I, I'm clearly, I have issues. Um, oh, I've played all of them. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so with Dragon Age Origins, um, people saying, oh, it's so good, it's so grim. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But there are certain points where Dragon Age Origins, one of my favorite games, crosses the line. And, and I always get asked, well, why? It's amazing. No. Well, do you know what Darkspawn are made in that game? Oh, yeah. Oh. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, you know, there are certain... And they handle it quite well. You know, you, they don't show you. They just hint at it, like Hitchcock. Do you know what I mean? Your, your mind does the, yeah. the thing for you. But does that need to be there? No. Like, th th does the scene where... There's two human guards, and they see like a, a dead elf girl. And Modern says, "Oh, they're so, they're so pretty. I hate it when the, you know they get screwed up like that when combat." The other one goes, "What do you care? She's still warm, right? Do I need that? <laughs> like, do I really? No, you know." So I think there are there are places where 40k definitely should have pulled back and gone, "Nah, we don't need Domunculabras. That's fine. We can just hint that that's what's going on rather than outwardly showing you." In a Uriel Ventress novel of all fucking places, but like, I, I don't think GW will like that thing will never see the light of day in mainstream media. I, 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 because... I, yeah, I'm surprised I've reckoned it already and said it's just not the thing. It doesn't happen, you know. Yeah, I just, I'm, yeah, they probably they shouldn't really because if you think about it from a, even just a mainstream audience perspective, that just might make people just go like, nah, this isn't for me, and yeah. that's not what you want. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, it, you, 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 so it, it's been going that way for years. You know, it, this isn't a, a new thing. And even though I, I do campaign against it on the channel, you know, yeah, Grimdark should stay there. It should be more third edition. And if that's what you want, welcome. You know, and 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 I, I've often said that the way the law should go is we should have a Grimdark side of the galaxy and a Rebute Gilliman side of the galaxy. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think should go. the big... The part that's having a disconnect with people, I think, is just defining... I remember what Dan Abnett was asked when he was... You know, people asked him, what really is Grim, Grimdark? And he says, it's an utterly bleak universe where there is, there's room for hope, but not hope with a capital H. Yes, and that's I really think good. Yeah. The, the disconnect people, particularly hobbyists who've been around for a while, like they have, is that with the resurgence of Gilliman... It kind of feels like it's hope with the big H, yeah. Rather than he's going win. to win, you know. And so, which is actually kind of a relatively easy fix because all that, ha that has to happen is the Imperium just needs to take a big L, just and kill them off. yeah, like it just just kill him off. In, That's what I, do. I think. Well, I think they should kill off a Primarch. Yeah, but I think it should be. Well, it's difficult because I think it has a. As a, from a story, from a like a well, from a lore perspective, like lore and a story perspective, yeah. I would very much want like character arcs, and I want yeah, sure. things like conclusions. But then, as a setting, Warhammer is always going to be a setting. Not you know, we're in the middle of a war; we're not at the end of it. Um, so yeah. I think again, like things will be a tabletop miniature because people will buy it. Well, well do, you I not, think... do you not think that 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 they should just make new ones? Do you know what I mean? Like, like they new should be ones? like like Talos from. Um... From uh, the the Night Night Lords books, do yeah. you know what I mean? That I would love. I would collect Night Lords if that was a guy I could go and get. Or Decimus, who's like his son, quote unquote. Do you know what I mean? Like, dude, I would collect them in a heartbeat, and that's the new Warmaster for me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, that's that's it. Abaddon, who? I I want that guy. You know. Well, I um one I talked to my friends about, which was I think there should be Chaos Civil War, yeah. and it was the idea of that. It was an arc in which brought back Lorgar. Because I, well, first of all, I actually agree with what Aaron Dembski Bowden said. Lorgar should have died during the Horus Heresy. Would have been, oh, perfection. Yeah, would have been it would have been amazing. Um, but if he is around, it should be a thing where the title of like Chosen of Chaos or like War Master should be a sort of cold war between a returned pri demon Primarch, like properly like Lorgar versus Abaddon. Because it makes it so much more interesting in terms of, first of all, sick models from both sides because it could be an escalating war thing hmm. and it could give the idea in which there's again like sort of grim conflict between the idea that chaos itself should not be unified it's always a competing thing and yeah like, it should like, always be it, turning against itself like and for abaddon as well it may just gives him an excuse like say he actually like he doesn't lose it but say like abaddon is slowly like depowered in some way and has to hmm. go on a character arc to either change from what he is now which is a 
an unwilling puppet of chaos to something that's a bit more of like he should he should be much more in the realm of like he he realizes he's like Horus and he's utterly outmatched by these gods who are you know he lets him think himself in control. Um, so you, I, I, I would, um, I'm gonna jump, okay. I'm gonna jump off that because I think you you might like an idea. So my idea for Abaddon for his death would be that, you know, the, the Chaos Gods empower somebody else. And Abaddon's left with a choice. Either be like Horus and submit to us and live and be the War Master, or you're basically going to die. You know, you're, you're going to be killed by your own. And he chooses to die. Like, it's the most badass, I am not my father moment of, yeah, you can kill me all you want, but, like, I, I'm not... I am Big Boss. He is literally Metal Gear Solid Big Boss in 40k. I want a universe where my men can fight forever and never be left without a place like the Emperor was going to do to us. He was going to leave us and leave us on our own and we were never going to be relevant ever again in, in a galaxy of peace. No, no, no. I want forever war, you know? And in, you know, there is only war. That, that, that is Abaddon, you know what I mean? And, and he should go down swinging and you, you should give him a a suitable send-off. And if you did that, people would be like, that was probably the greatest character arc ever, considering it started in 30k and went all the way through, you know what I mean? And you give him that ending, and then everyone's going to really despise the new big chaos, big bad for killing him. That's what you want. <laughs> like, you want emotion. You want people to, the, the you know. craziest thing if I live through the death of Abaddon in my lifetime. That would be wild. I mean, I'm down for it, but I think... Um... It'd be, I mean, it'd be crazy if we even get to see that. It would be crazy. I, I think, mean, yeah, it, it's insane, but... Yeah. Oh, no, I like I like the idea of it, just because, um, obviously, with, like, Horus Heresy and all that stuff, I, well, it's hard because a lot of Abaddon's things have been like, yes, I was losing on purpose 12 times uh, <laughs> when I'm squared yeah, as well. Yeah, I can't roll. I roll. My eyes hurt. They roll that hard. Well, I, they could just give him more novels to actually... Exp like if there was a he hasn't had his third novel yet or like Black Legion novel and if that one was set during some of the Black Crusades Matt like it, it, mm. there's so many things to easily like flesh out pad and fix although I again like Abaddon is one of those characters where I I wish I gave a little like surprisingly like he's there but the actual love he's given is a bit more like you know we're reading about it in a historical book rather than a novel yeah so here is abaddon the, like, walking around the ship sort of thing i mean I, I like the black legion books i thought that both of them were really good um mm. um the short story is less so because obviously gray knight's getting a pounding again for no reason um but in terms of of the books themselves like apart listen i have issues with this kandor kion like i just think he's a bit you know like aaron dembski belden's sat in the bath and he's gone hmm what's the coolest man i can make and he's just like, mm, yeah, of course he's got a dark Eldar girlfriend, yes. And he's, and he's just done all of these things. And it's like, you stop taking it seriously after a while. Um, but what they did really well was they humanized Abaddon. And I thought, okay, if that's where we're going with this, then I can kind of get behind the losing 12 times thing. But they've not done that at all. In fact, they've not really gone forward with any law at all in 10th, which is one of the main reasons why yeah. I think it's in, in, a, in a roundabout way, it's been a bit of a failure, you know? I would say it was very bizarre in terms of like when they described ninth edition with like oh the necrons are on force but then i didn't really get that from a law perspective like i didn't really feel the threat i feel like it was just a as it was very obviously a thing to release a new model range or update yeah. the model range yeah and the tyranny is one that the fourth tyrannic war happened supposedly yeah and it's somewhere. like even even from the law like law youtube perspective we're like yeah, it happened, but it's nowhere near as like cool as like what was like the Battle of Macrag or any, you know, what I mean? like it feels like it was like a a bit of a nothing burger, um, mm. which is disappointing. But I understand like, like I almost if, with a lot of Warhammer, if it's like if I'm not into it, I just generally don't like. I have the luxury of like on my channel where I just get to pick the thing I like, yeah, yeah, and I, and I want to do next. So if I just think that thing, I'm just not that into it. I'd, again, luckily with Warhammer, there's so much of it. Like the the newer releases, particularly of 10th edition or like characters, and, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not into it. There's still so much I can just go be like, yep, that's what I'm into. I'm going to do more of that. Mm -hmm. I definitely think we're in a, we're all in a strange time where a lot of the 
like there's like the original like kind of like author crew like the ones who have written out so much of the horrors heresy hmm. a lot of them are they're not like retiring but it almost seems like there's a handing over to a next generation of writers and i think they are slightly under supported by particularly what i mentioned like the art direction like the book covers some of it like i promise you some of it looks like Fortnite. So I just, I, I, which is not like, you know what I mean? Like when these people say don't judge a book by its cover with Warhammer, there's so many books like, you know what I mean? Like you got to yeah, yeah. give them something to stand out and mm. to like, be like, that's badass. Um, I definitely think they like, that's something, something's going wrong there. Um, but I, I, we're seeing a new generation of authors who are hopefully going to come in and I've seen interviews like, as in like black library say like some things that they've said about books. And quite a lot of them do like really understand i think particularly like character which i enjoy a lot mm. the one that authors i particularly am a big fan of recently is like mike brooks who he written quite a few of the orc books which are hilarious yeah he also wrote the returned lion book and like it's not like the best book i've ever written yeah yeah it's on the forest and i just thoroughly enjoyed it because of the great understanding of character arc in the book but there is a slight, you you can tell like the slight piece that's missing, maybe and that will like will help um, sort of please some of the older and you know established Warhammer fans. Is like there's like I feel like they maybe have talked about in the lore so much like the grim dark future that they almost some of the new authors don't feel like they need to go near it because like it's already established, it's already a thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like there might be more things in the lore and particularly like in the codex covers, art releases and all that stuff, just to like reinforce it a little bit. The Blood Angels um, at the time like recently came out, the Blood Angels um, Death Company stuff. Like yeah. I just, the box cover, really, really like that. You know, someone's made a good choice there in terms of art direction and style. And like even to the point where like I'm I currently play World Eaters, but some of my things are like converted up uh, Death Company to obviously like they fell for corn or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. My cool. my Angron is not an Angron. My Angron is Usharan the vampire model ah. in like Death, Death Company ah. uh, things with like wings on his back, which I wish I had a picture of, but he's not in my current house. So but, I, I'll, I'll uh, tell you um, what we'll do. Right, I've, I think somebody's I've got my ring doorbell going. So I'm going to do. I'm going to pause the recording. I'll be right mm -hmm. back, and we'll take a, a quick, like, two-minute break, and I'll come right back, all right? One sec. Sure, go for it, go for it. Let me just... Oh, mate, no, we're back on again, by the way. But, yeah, yeah, no, waffle away. Like, this is what was the entire point <laughs> was <laughs> was waffle central. That's what this channel is, man. We, we, are, we are kings of the wafflers. I'm ready. Uh, what's the, what was the next Patreon question? Because I'm sure they... Uh, so we've got... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Are there any parts of the vast 40k lore trove that you would retcon to give the Amber King take on it instead? Oh, you can do multiple. Like you can do, well, can do multiple. Well, I mentioned my dislike of Vulcan earlier, did I? Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. the boring character. Uh, first thing I would retcon necessarily about it would be Salamanders. And I would retcon, like, they had, like, a gene flaw initially in, like, the Great Crusade where, like, they were too self sacrifice or whatever. Yes. And then Vulcan came back, like, no, 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 only do it a little bit. I swear, chill, fam. Um, <laughs> I would retcon that to where, you know the story of Vulcan and the Eldar child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. I thought that was a really good, that's the only, like, decent part of the lore in which it shows his level of, like, this is, like, a super kind person who let their rage take over and they went too far mm. and i like the idea of that being incorporated into the salamanders where say like with warhammer there's often you know there's polarizing extremes a lot of the time mm. i like the idea of it being like because right now the salamanders are slightly boring in terms like they're too goody two shoes yeah like but then i think they should keep those aspects of it but like say they have say like the you know the blood angels have like death company the Raven Guard somehow have this gene flaw where they get super like express expressio depressio, which is still like a gene flaw. Space Wolves have Wolfen. I feel like the Salamanders could be salvaged in some kind of way where they have say a part of them where like some marines are essentially they get too much of like bloodlust, or like there's a part where like they fall to like the same flaw which their Primarch had where they are meant to be these like paragons of virtue and kindness towards mm. like fellow humans 
but then there's a part of them like there's like a deep-seated rage of like say like the quiet person who has been pushed too much and i would if that was like present within the chapter so like not that not that they have like their own kind of death company but there's like an aspect of them which is like their shame of like the people who are not following the um promethean creed or you know they're not the so teachings do, of do you know time. obviously death company you know things of like that and there mm. are people like like the the flesh terrors for the blood angels do you not mm. think marrying into that the black dragons who are a salamander successor chapter they could be the extreme version of the salamanders actually already are so you could have these like dudes oh, who are kind of like wolverine yeah. you know what i mean so instead of vulcan being this perpetual he's basically wolverine he, can, he, gets, he gets these bone blades coming out of his wrists and, and he's you know yeah, if he goes mental, he can like you know grow these bones and almost become like a like a almost like a possessed demon, you know, and that kind of a thing. So yeah, something about it takes what is like what's meant to be the good thing, and then there's a dark underbelly to it. I definitely think if they found a way to make the black dragons more incorporated with like a rivalry with the salamanders to a way, like mm. they already are a little bit, but. Even more so, like that thing should be. I, I would change that in Warhammer Law. Like, if I had control day one, I would do that straight away. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I'd probably kill. I'd have Horus. Like, spoilers for people who haven't read all of Horus, Horus Heresy. When they, the traitors assemble upon Ulanor just before they uh, siege Terra, I would have Horus kill Lorgar because mm. it comes so full circle. Mm. And it would have been like Lorgar would have had a great. And like and then he like begs for his life at the end like the shriveling coward that he is like because like, he sort of develops a facade over the horse heresy being like i'm actually the most chosen of all of you you just don't know it yet and i swear <laughs> i'm the most amazing one it's ever i even nerd you know i even cucked fulgrim a little bit um but yeah. i just if they had like lorgar die because i think he serves no purpose in terms of chaos undivided because it's yeah. again like there's a reason why I wanted to put him and Abaddon in conflict because they kind of almost serve like the same purpose in some regard. Mm. Um, I do like word bearers, to be fair, and the, the idea of like the word bearers Primarch being dead, amazing. Ferris Manus, not that interesting. Yeah. Iron Hands being completely crippled by the fact that Primarch died, amazing. You know, what I mean, like I love the fact well, that the, Ferris Manus is dead. Uh, well, one of my community the other day when we did um, Service so Sunday, be. Feel free to join us one day if you want to, by the way, man. So what we're doing is um, sure. we're rewriting the law from the ground up of 40k of what we would do if we were, yeah, we did the Emperor this time around. But somebody came up with an amazing um, Ferris Manus idea is that he's actually on Mars. His capsule catapults into Mars and the Mechanicum becomes the Mechanicum through this avatar of the Omnissiah who is Ferris Manus. And Ferris Manus is the one who kills the Void Dragon and that's why he gets his metal arms. So the Emperor throws the Void Dragon to Mars, and Ferris Manus, thousands of years later, kills the Void Dragon, you know, this, this Catan shard beneath the ground. And that's where he gets his arms from. And I was like, that is the most, that's badass. And I need to credit the guy. I, I He's coming next week to, to back to the stream. I've, I've, I've emailed him. Um, but that's, like that's, one of the, that's one of the best ideas I've ever seen in my, I was like, that is amazing. Um... But yeah, no, I see what you mean about like Lorgar and things. Another, another a kiss of the arse moment for Amber King here. Um, but uh, the Yargal Tower video got me to basically re-engineer my entire Space Marine Force to be loyalist word bearers, like, but in the forty-first mm. millennium. So that, that's where they come from. Um, Monarchia, all that kind of thing. They're from Monarchia, literally. Uh, you know, they they were like, you yeah, know, well, you know, the Emperor's the Emperor. You know, what are you gonna do? He's a god, and. Um, when the emperor comes down so the, and is um, like, you know, don't worship me. Uh, no, so he had. Um, uh, say that again, sorry. Is it like the erudite, which is like the one? Yes. Do you know about that. Kind of. Yes, yes, the, the, yes, the dreadnought. Yes, kind of like that. Yeah. So um, they they looked at the emperor doing that to Monarchia as a test of faith, and they saw a well, Lorgos failed his test of faith. He, he's no longer worth following, and of course these guys are these zealot close combat mental side of the word bearers that we don't see in the books because that you know they're not on brand but they're there so on monarchia that you have all of the word bearers standing in nice neat rows and these guys are right at the back because nobody likes them and they're all in like world eaters style in a pack of astartes rather than in nice neat rows you know what i mean and they're just pacing around mm. with like gunning chain blades and stuff 
And these are literally 40k space marines in 30k. So they're already there. They're already like, the Emperor's a god. Anybody who doesn't believe that is dead on arrival. You know, we're just going to chew right through them. And uh, they, they look at the Emperor saying that to Lorgar and they go, Nah, my feet, I'd win. You know, I, you're still a god and we're going off. And they end up being um, loyalist and they end up being, you know... Uh, and that's where we are in the 41st millennium. They, they get their own chapter and off they go, sort of a thing. But, like, it, it's just something that I... I like it. The, the, the good thing about about law and about doing your own thing is finding where the weak points are in the current narrative and filling those in. That's the best part of it to me, is, is that going, like, okay, what do the Ultramarines not really have? Hmm. A bunch of undisciplined psychos. Let's do that, then. You know, what, what do... You know, the Black Dragons are that for the Salamanders, right? Uh, even though they're good guys. But what I would want to do for the Salamander successor chapter, if I did one, is Salamanders who think Vulcan's a fucking nerd. And they're like, no, these people don't matter. You know, they're in the way. Kill them all. They're just civilians. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, there should be. Yeah. Figure out where that bl blind spot is and go for it and, and be interesting that way, you know? It'd be um, hilarious if, um, if, you know, the Marine's malevolent. Both yeah. Ones. Yeah. Like if they, because yeah. there's the in the law, if they, uh, if the salamander turn, like their skin will turn to the ashen black. If they, if they experience the unique radiation of nocturne, it would be yeah. crazy if they did that and then one of them like captured ones where the salamander turned up, and they took him to nocturne and then he just started <laughs> to like <laughs> shift be amazing. and they'll be like, and they'll be like, oh my god, they've been salamanders the entire That'd time. That would be so funny. Dude. That would be, honestly, that would be that would be such a cool law mode in terms of like because they'd have to reconcile with the fact of like a sons of Vulcan have perhaps been the most bloodthirsty civilian not caring faction throughout all the basically most of the chapters other than like flesh terrors. But well, that's kind of it, it though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, just in terms of like what I would there's not there's not necessarily things that I would think are fundamentally broken. There's just a lot of things I feel like should be tweaks. Like have opportunities to be improved upon yeah. to perhaps the enjoy like basically every, in the case where everybody wins. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, I don't think there's with a lot of things. I almost feel like Dan Abner in a way, which he often describes it as he's not necessarily like he doesn't have ownership over Warhammer. He feels like someone who's visiting, making a contribution, and then steps back. And I often mm. feel like with my content, I don't feel like I'm um, necessarily have any ownership or any kind of power over it i almost course, feel yeah. like i'm just trying to, i'm trying to almost i'm opening a book page for someone else to enjoy it mm. and i think with a lot of things in warhammer again some things are just straight up stupid or either done poorly um or just okay it just needs more tweaking i think and obviously not to go on the deep end of like super big controversies but my um obviously like the most Are we going one there? Oh well, no, no, it's slightly. If you don't want to go near it, no, no, go like, for it, man. Like, I, I'm surprised you wanted to do that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go yeah, on. I'm not because I'm not shy about it. Okay. I think even from what I understand, getting some workshop in house were also like, what did someone do? Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. They um, don't want it either, man. They don't want it either. I think. Well, even from like um, the perspective of what was the law writers, they actually wanted to explore that way like Aaron Densky Bowden had even said they'd actually want to do that even over like was it over 10 years ago mm -hmm. at some point I assumed it was one of those things like it was going to be inevitable in terms of obviously the whole fact that like, Custody's creation is a complete mystery and in my opinion should always remain mysterious yes like yeah I, definitely I like they do it like not knowing how it's done mm. um my fellow YouTubers just said you know they can just fix this in like two steps where they basically say at the siege of the second siege of terror where like all the corn demons attack it's like you know mm. the um uh the series the two novel series is it watchers of the throne yeah they have that, and then like loads of the kasogis got massacred mm. and they often say how the kasogis are recruited from like the noble born of terror mm. my friend just said they could just fix this in like two seconds where they basically say due to the massive losses suffered by the custodies they would now a Rogan recruit from the daughters of the nobles of terror as well mm. and therefore you don't have all the backlog like even luton says the backlog problem of being like the entire yeah. 10, oh yeah, yeah. it's always been that way uh, seems convoluted so yeah. i think again like because then with most people i'm sure they would find that as a much happier solution in terms of like 
product, like people who just enjoy the models, they'd be like, oh, look, they just introduced something new. And then the other people who are actually like me and you, like who invest in the law, they're mm-hmm. like, okay, I knew this was coming and I found a way to somewhat understand like, and I'm be okay with it um, in terms of, like, cause I know in terms of law wise, like law, law, just from a law perspective, there's no, there's not much need to change in Warhammer, but Warhammer oh, no. is always going to be a product. And if they wish to make particularly like custodian models more viable to the market, I understand like that's just going to happen. And I feel like there's a way, like, like I said, with most things in Warhammer, like again, like for most stories, most of our beloved stories are written to st- because Games Workshop said to an author, we've got these new products, can you make a story about <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. So it's nothing new. Mm. Um, I feel like that's just one of the ways, like, if they did that tomorrow, I feel like it's already, like, because they do retcons all the time. Mm. Just, like, just salve, like in- integrate it in the way in which it deserves to be integrated. Like, with so many other things, like, it's why I don't like the Leagues of Votan so much, because it feels like a complete, like, you know that thing that was squats? Yeah, it's not... It's nothing like that artwork it used to look like, and yeah. now it's this thing. I'm like, whoa! You get like um, you get your head spun because it's just not done well. And I yeah. think they'd even agree. No one, not a single person, would agree like it was done well. Well, I, I think like from, from someone who who engages with with the uh, the other side a lot, like the people who complain yeah, yeah, about yeah. Um, the the uh, the cust- female custodians, I think boiling down their point of view and, and where I've kind of come around because I, I I've always said it doesn't matter. Like whatever Games Workshop does doesn't matter because the, the hobby is yours. It doesn't I don't give a shit what they do. They yeah. can tell me Space Marines are all purple with pink polka dots. It wouldn't wouldn't change a thing for me. But the the thing is, is that um you you touched on it there and in, in that it's very messy. Saying that they were always like that. Number one, it's talking down to your audience. That that we always we always had female custodians. You're just stupid. No, it's talking down to your audience. It's not good. Um, don't ever do that. Like especially not to 40k fans. Oh my god. Um, and secondary. Um, they're not. There is a clear sense that they're not doing it for the right reasons. So, as you just said, there, there is a way to fix this, and that's what you say: is Space Marines are mass produced because the Emperor was in a mm. rush, um, and we we don't have any other ways of doing it, even with the Primaris Space Marines. So, we can't have female Space Marines. Just put that out there. Give that to people. So we can't have female Space Marines, but we can have female custodians. Why? Because the ref- the process is so refined. And so esoteric that the only reason we didn't have female custodians is because we had enough sons to make more custodians. But now we don't. Now we, we we actually use the Emperor's template and we can easily make female custodians because it was such an elegantly done process. It was the highest form of art of creating a star like individuals. So it's actually quite easy to go and make female custodians. It's just been tradition that we didn't. Done. You could have done that yeah, I- and saved the entire mess. You know, I think um, particularly again, I don't have any credited um, source on this, but from what I have heard through, <laughs> I was saying, I know, like in whispers, mm-hmm. I heard it was completely panic station behind the scenes of being like well, that wasn't meant to happen. Yeah, um, but it's one of those things like Games Workshop don't really like in their mind. I imagine they probably don't think it's worth fixing until there's an actual thing to be sold. Well, I, I also no. don't think they take their own hobby that seriously, you know, and if I'm being honest. Uh, I, I don't probably think not, they realize... Probably not as much on the no. company side. They don't realize how the, invested people are. I think from a lot, again, from their perspective, it's it's their job, not yeah. their... Yeah. For a, lot of, for a lot of people who... I can't discredit, like a lot of people who do work there, it is their hobby and they enjoy... Like games which I've enjoyed a lot of like um goodwill in terms of, like people really care about Warhammer and as they should no matter like you know, as uh, you know because it's damn awesome yeah um I think I understand like as a like you like, even in games watch of history sometimes when a fan runs a thing they don't necessarily you know what I mean like it may almost run it into the ground in terms of like yeah yeah it, it may not you know what I mean? Like it's gotta it's gotta hit something called, you know, <laughs> the market. So yeah. it's gotta hit a certain thing. Um and then the 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 companies that do it well, they find that the balance that of what I always think. Cause like I think most people are reasonable adults and they understand the level of like I understand a certain amount of my thing. Like white like sports has to go through sponsorships and all that. You know, you got a certain amount of like mm. even on like us as YouTubers, we understand like we've got to sometimes 
you're somewhat you gotta play the game yeah, you're making algorithm happy because if yeah. you don't you're um essentially not thriving and it, you mm -hmm. know the things you want to do are not possible um so i understand like they just someone needs to like somewhat you know like be a bit more in tune on the balance i think because again like it's not i don't think it's it's not it wasn't end of the world for me but i definitely thought to myself wow that is a, like just human like so, so someone is just not doing their job that well <laughs> like i don't yeah. think it's like that well great. i'll put this way that, um, that that tweet i'd be surprised if that person still works for the company like because if that was me i mean the understanding i don't think they do you, you know yeah I, maybe well. I, I i think um in terms of, of how Games Workshop work, like, it, you know, when, when you speak to people there, all they want is an easy life. They just want to sell models and keep selling. The, the, the very the mission statement you're told, that you get your little black book. Do you know what that is, the little black book? When you, you um... I'm not 100% sure, because I've only, my experience is much more on the customer okay. side of it, right? So, so when you join retail as a manager, you get a little black book, and it is basically the mission statement written by Tom Kirby and then added to by Kevin Roundtree later on. And it is basically the how to sell models and what Games Workshop is for. If you, and then they always say, if you ever get confused, go to your little black book and read what's in the little black book. And the very start of it, it says, we at Games Workshop, this is our mission statement. We want to make the best wargaming miniatures in the world and we want to continue doing this forever. That's it. That's the mission statement. And so anything was... You know, so go 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 finish. Uh, anything that goes as an antithetical to that, they will cut out like a cancer. Um, but that's good and bad. It means that yeah, people who make that tweet will be gone. Yeah, as soon as they do that. But it also means that prices will continue to rise. We'll, we're going to continue to get a dumbing down of options in terms of what we get in our boxes. You know, because you can make more refined models by giving less options, things like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, what were you going to say? I was. Oh, I almost forgot. What I was oh, it's because. In my mind, wasn't Games Workshop founded by? Well, no, sorry, not founded by. The idea was like obviously when they first started out, they just wanted to sell models for things like Dungeons and Dragons yes. and other. Yes, companies. they sold models for everybody else's. So Citadel and Miniatures was completely different to, to Games Workshop. It, it, so Games Workshop was a retail store business that would would sell third party models for other games. Um, with Citadel, they would start to make their own games with people like Rick Priestley, Warhammer uh, 40k later on. Rogue Trader, and uh, Rogue Trader, by the way, was nothing to do with 40k. So, um, Rogue Trader was made by Rick Priestley, it, and it was a completely different game about being in your own starship, and it sounded really fucking cool, actually. Uh, yeah, it's like Elite Dangerous, basically. It's Elite Dangerous, but in a box. That's what you do it. And wasn't it like? Okay, guys, like, keep going. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, he he is it brought onto the company. They, they say to him, um, "You're going to do Rogue Trader. Great." And, the, and that goes on the back burner for years. He's like, when am I going to do Rogue Trader? And they went, well, we, we want you to do this Warhammer thing, but we want Rogue Trader in there as well because we need to use the license, so put it in. Okay, uh, I've already written it, so I'll just call it Rogue Trader. <laughs> that was it. That's literally the story. You know, that's where you know, all of the... It, it links back nicely to what you were saying before. These things always happen by accident. None of it's malicious. It's always just humans going, um, shit. Uh, where am I going to put this? I'll just put it there. Oh, it's all blown up. Oh dear, you know that kind of thing. Well, even with um, with, like, with the Warhammer itself, it was in, it was just written to to sell this model range. Yeah, literally. I remember Dan Abnett saying literally. the Horrors Heresy only came about because they had one mold for the game Titanicus. Yeah, and they had to explain why they only could use the one mold. And they basically went, "Well, there was a massive civil war." And then people went, "Well, what was it called?" He went, "Oh, it was just called the Horrors Heresy. No context until yeah. later." Yeah. So, like, again, like that's, it makes sense from their perspective because, like, the law is just there to push a product. Because if it didn't, if it was just cool miniatures and there was no law behind it, it wouldn't sell nearly as well. Mm. In fact, we wouldn't even be that interested in it. I think, yeah, it's just I, I more try and speak their language on it in terms of I wish to voice what. I feel, and then to explain to them how much better that is for their wallet, because that's the only thing like the like like you you mentioned in your channel, it's kind of the only language like the companies really hear, wasn't it? Recently, McDonald's were lowering their prices or something yeah. because they yeah. noticed a drop in sales. I think with Warhammer, 
if they notice a particular lack of interest in certain things, but then the things that are more what you like, and then they sell better, then they go, hang on a minute, what is that formula there? Because again, like companies just, like companies are like toddlers. They just don't hear until you really have to um, voice it to them. Or like, you know, you like with most things that like you vote with your wallet because if either things are doing well or they're not doing well enough, um, that's the thing that they're going to understand. Like particularly with, I always think to myself like Horus Heresy, particularly the game as it is now. I always think like it's so expensive to get into like the actual horrors heresy. Oh, dude! Range. Yeah. But, but to be fair though, I, I I was shocked when I went into the local store and I was like, oh okay, I, I guess I might pick up some horrors heresy marines. There's ten in this box. Uh, no, there's twenty in there. Ooh. Yeah, the marines. <laughs> like like my um my idea for like kit bashing and making a new like I was thinking about making death guard at once. I was like, it's actually cheaper to go buy the is it Mark Four. Yeah, Mark, Mark Four. Uh, Mark, Mark Four. And, Mark Three and Four. Yeah. It's cheaper to go buy them and then make like own version of like plague marines from them than actually to buy 10 plague marines. And I think definitely at this point now, um, Games Workshop will probably see they're probably gonna see a slight, a slight arch in terms of like, like with new people coming in or even other stuff, they'll be like, oh, that's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I think they may even have to downscale like i always think to myself what if they actually did like a separate balance thing for like a thousand points or, like, i can't, the game I can't see them yeah i mean i there, there, there is probably a... not on the business side because it makes people less buy less product <laughs> exactly yeah again like every single thing they do has got to be conductive to that mission statement and and if you if you do anything like i brought up the fact that i i advertised why i advertised my store um and i got a disciplinary for advertising my store because I, I used to walk around the local shopping center with a guy called Pierre the Primaris Marine. And he was just this massive <laughs> Primaris Marine cutout that I'd walk around. And I had in my right hand, you know, the single blister pack Space Marine. You know, I had mm -hmm. that guy. I had a, an invitation card to my store to come in and do an, an, an introduction with me. And the first few times I did this, I had I, I was followed by about ten families back to the store after my lunch break. <laughs> like it was like, you know, it's Easter holiday. Let's go and why not? You know, it's something to do. Um, all the young lads are like, wow, look at that because it's cool. It's a fucking eight foot tall Primaris Space Marine, dude. Like you know, it stands out. Anyway, I was I was caught on you know obviously by people taking photographs and stuff and people compl not complain but they passed it along to people at the chain, and I found out. That they were actually doing it as a congratulation thing, like saying, "Look, look at this guy going above and beyond." And, and they were like, "Yeah, we need to have a word about this Games Workshop. We do not advertise." I was like, "Well, what do you mean?" Because our only competitors on the high street, do you know who they are? And I was like, "Uh, maybe Game? No, Ann Summers." What? Yeah, Ann Summers. They're our competition because they're a bespoke product that is very expensive, and they don't do sales because because no because they are. Their audience is their audience, and nobody, nobody else's. That's it. Like we, we don't do sales. And I was like, well, I wasn't selling. I was advertising. It was, yeah, we don't do that either. We're, we're above that now. We don't do that. So that's the kind of brain rot that is in certain parts of the company, and that's one of the reasons why I couldn't stick it out in the end. Just couldn't be there anymore. But that's it's it's one they example. They definitely of enjoy. What they, did. they definitely enjoy perhaps the most. I would probably say one of the most passionate audiences in terms of like with um you know like with films what yeah. really gets films going a lot of time is word of mouth and yeah. i think particularly with warhammer like even someone on your channel who is being critical about the points where they're not doing well enough or like you see it as like a negative yeah like it's still like the amount of free advertising that is done through like <laughs> the amount of channels games or other things i think they they probably rightly recognize now that the thing that's maybe like in an aspect the high street is sort of dead in some mm. or at least in the uk in some way mm -hmm. so where's the next customer base and it's it's the ones who are going to enjoy the ip uh rightly so like space ring 2 i'm sure you've been seeing it on your channel um Dude, has yeah, done a massive the shit. boost for everyone's analytics i mean yeah. luton must be having luton is dining <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> must be having a good old christmas this year I mean, he's gonna be doing yeah. quite well luton, luton must be eating well um yeah. but I think particularly like the IP, you can definitely tell like the IP is sort of 
it's being crafted in a way in which it's ready to receive this massive new influx of people being interested in it. Yeah, yeah. And, like, if you think about Warhammer particularly, like, my partner is into Harry Potter. Not, like, crazily, mm -hmm. but just likes Harry Potter. You, I don't think you can ever capture an audience as large as, like, something like Harry Potter, which appeals to anyone of any age. That, that's the zeitgeist, Warhammer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah like, yeah. Warhammer never will quite get to that level i think but it can get pretty high up there and it, i think it has aspirations of things like you know shout out to it's not going very well but like halo like halo got a tv series halo is a is a recognizable franchise most people would like, like oh that's the thingy the super soldier thingy guy mm -hmm. and warhammer would like to be in that echelon i think and particularly i think like you know most people who are going to the shops these days like you, even your experience, you see it. It's not necessarily like the older blokes. It's more like the younger kids who, like when we were even kids going into it, you don't necessarily understand what's really going on. Mm -hmm. But um, so, like, say if you are like kids going into the shop, what can they buy? Like, oh, here you go for you know, young kid, you you little bloke, you can have some space marines, and then obviously, oh, you know, there's a young child over there who's a girl. Like, oh, you can have the female custodian. Like, that's the thing. I think it's built. And that's why, like, there's a lot of building resentment maybe in the time, of, like, now in the hobby because I think there's been that massive thing of where, like, things are simplified and then, you know, like, it's been, like, tightened up at the edges and it's ready to be launched in that yeah. stratosphere. Yeah. Like, like with like with mod most things, when it comes with, like, a mainstream eye, it's mainstream criticism as well. And I think a lot of the things that are about Warhammer, they're trying to get it ready so that they don't get themselves in hot water which i don't I, obviously from a company perspective yeah, i don't blame them yeah because again if i run like with anyone like even when running on youtube you want it to be successful you wish to talk to more people and you wish to have more engaging audience like you know what I mean? like no one is built no one's like yeah i only want to talk with me and my 20 good bodies and then that's yeah, it yeah 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 um you want things to do better and i think with like with warhammer one it maybe needs like a settling period of like it needs to understand what it like really is because right now i think it's kind of being like am i this thing or am mm. i not and i think once they settle on like i mentioned it earlier particularly like art style art direction other things which are like so ingrained like like from software games i always think to myself as like that's one of those things where like that can be any franchise necessarily and you know it's a from software game in terms yeah. of yeah. world like how the world feels mm. and i think in warhammer it just needs to like solidify itself a bit more solidify what it is and stick with it and be like be ready to like you know stand tall chested and be like ready to let the like you know the mainstream audience see what warhammer can be because again for you, for people who are listening like they may aren't looking forward to that moment or they're like you know mm. oh my god people are gonna ruin it um at some point though it's just going to be like warhammer will i'm sure warhammer for people who've been around the hobby for a long time if someone you know if i go back to like the green the goblin green bases day and i showed them warhammer miniatures of today it's almost unrecognizable yeah I, I i think a lot of them so, would, would like cream the pants if you showed them like primaris marines and oh by the way we've got the lion back now what yeah yeah the lion's here you know we, we, he's actually a model you can get oh, yeah. you know it's like if, if I, things are good but also, like, um, um, I also say to myself as well, I don't think like because I'm someone who gets to constantly read about characters that I enjoy, get to make content about the things that I'm drawn to. And there's almost like an endless supply of it. It's so much. Mm. But I also say to myself, I don't know what the state of the hobby will be in like 10 or 15 years time, because I think back to myself, like, you know, when the launch of Primaris came and everyone was like, it's the like the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire nah, life. Yeah, 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 and then but then. And then nowadays, it's somewhat like, it's not the worst thing ever, but it was clearly like, it just wasn't everyone's cup of tea. But then there are some things that came out of it, which are cool. Like I like the um, the John Blanche Black Templar model, I think. Mm -hmm. of. I think of certain things like my my Infernal Master of Thousand Sandwich came out, and I love that model to death. Oh my God, it's so overpowered. <laughs> I think of the World Eater ones that are like in better scale, that are like kind of scaled up a little bit. Again, like I don't really play Space Marines just because I'm not, as into the 
ridiculous amount of range there is for it. But yeah. I'm also someone who liked Iron Hands. So when I did have Space Marines, I made them look like Iron Hands because it was grittier and darker. Mm -hmm. So there was always something like I could fix about it again. Like, like I said earlier, you pick the thing that is your your head cannon, and they let they let you let, let you have that to some extent. I understand why? Like on their like website, it's the most bland looking representation of it because it's showing off a product. It's like an IKEA selection thing. Mm. It's very much like this is the most bare basic thing we have of it. You can do it how you want because it just comes as grey plastic. Well, I think but... with the with the Primaris Marines, I think it was more. Um, like I, I, personally... I know it's worse at the time as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, much... yeah. Like, like I, I, I never had a problem with them being there. I just thought it should have been just a range refresh, and that was it. You know, we, did, you could have done more cool things with call. Call should have been there to basically. You could, have, you should have come out of cryostasis, being, oh, the the, the Primark protocols on. I need to go and wake Gilliman up, and he goes and wakes him up. You don't need, you need, you don't need any of that. You get this guy from the near dark age of technology to go in there and wake him up, and that's it. He's, he's there. He's back. You don't need, you know, we could have just had a range refresh and it would have created a bit of controversy, yes, because people got, you know, first ball marines. But maybe do a thing where if you bring in your, I would, I, I said this at the time as well, is that we should have done, I say we, but not anymore, but you know what I mean. We should have done a thing where if you bring in your 1000 point first born army so I can put it in the, in the, to, to display it in the store, you get a free box of Primaris Space Marines, the new ones. That would have been a, you know, such a cool thing, you know, just to be like, yeah, mm. it's, it's more work for the manager, yeah, because you, because you, you know, one day it's this guy's models, and another day it'd be that guy's models, but it's still such a cool, nice thing to do for your custom base and things like that. But um, I should probably ask you this last question before we. Oh, go, go for it. it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, this is a nice one, though. How did Law Crimes get started, and what do you think the ending <laughs> goals are for that channel? I know you're only one person over there, so you can't really speak for everybody, but. Uh, Law Crimes is for the the beautiful people listening is just a small group channel we i am with uh pancreas no work the remembrance and deathless for the dark it, gods. It, it is my um, gym listen every day i'm in the gym yeah. i'm always on yeah it's um it just started out as um andy who's on the remembrance just contacted the rest of us one day and he asked us if he wanted to have like a channel where essentially well, the idea was we could make stuff that we couldn't normally like it wasn't safe for our own channels because of mm. the algorithm and it kind of developed more into a sort of impromptu podcast slash other things to do on the channel for fun it's one of those things where we are we all have our own channels so we can't dedicate the amount of time say like a normal like regular person could do to it so it doesn't get the amount of love it probably you know from like one person of course yeah channel would yeah. Yeah. but it's very much as a fun hangout thing i think particularly with youtube it can be quite a solitary existence um in terms of what your workload is you don't really have colleagues unless you put effort out there and it's more of a channel where we just explore topics from every part of warhammer which is aos fantasy the old world i hate saying the old world mm -hmm. <laughs> fantasy um 40k you know horror heresy it's one of those things where we just it's more of like just four idiots <laughs> talking about <laughs> warhammer law i promise you like it just we are we we deserve to be locked up um but it's much more of like a just again like it's a live thing we do because it's actually much it's much easier to do things live than it necessarily is to do um pre-recorded and editing yeah um and it's just saying we all do for fun i don't in terms of like his end goals of the channels it's actually not really we don't do it for money <laughs> at all. Like we yeah. actually, if I promise you, if we made no money, we'd all still probably do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more of a thing where uh, I just see it as like some bit of fun and um, just something I wouldn't get to do normally. I feel bad for a lot of people who potentially wouldn't get, like I'm sure with your channel, obviously you talk to other, uh, some of the YouTubers as well. Like you just, if you didn't ever, engage with other people about warhammer in that sort of way it would be such a difficult um it'd be bland experience. yeah it would be like yeah i mean i, I guess my I, i'm i'm small enough so people say to me often like do you not want to grow to like you know be huge and i'm like no forty thousand is my target and i don't really want to go above that because i like speaking to people you know and i and I, mm. I'm not normally the person who makes the first move because I think I'm bothering people. So I, I, I don't really email. Oh, Maybe, no, you gotta, you, you gotta know. get over it at some point. I know, I know. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been told that by, by Maka a lot of times. Like, you're stopping such a pussy, yeah, um, get up there. It's, it's, uh, if you don't ask, it just didn't happen a yeah. lot of time. So, like, yeah. my thing, I used to be really, I remember we talked about it before we even recorded, like, me contacting Voldemort, and I was like giggling like a little schoolgirl because yeah. I was like, oh my God, he answered me. <laughs> um, but now I've just like, if I've got the time for it and I'm interested, I'll be like, just send them. I, What's the worst that could happen if you send a message? Either it, either it happens or it doesn't happen a lot mm -hmm. of the times. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like it's just you know it's a bunch of grown blokes usually talking about Warhammer. So it's <laughs> like how <laughs> yeah. how difficult can it be? Yeah. Um, I think particularly like if people are listening as well a lot of time, you just got to kind of give most things at least a try a lot of time. Mm. I think you, you like particularly like a lot of people who are either like war gaming or like a hobby or perhaps in 40k a lot of us are probably maybe deal with anxieties or more shy like because it can be quite a safe like insular thing same thing with like dungeons and dragons a lot of the time it's one of those you just gotta like warhammer is great in the aspect like it just forces you you have to be you actually have to be friends with someone necessarily or like be out there to even go play it and you know so you got to get over sometimes your own your own barriers that you put in place mm -hmm. and uh i think law crime is one of those things like it helps me particularly for, like getting over you know if, you know like, every every week i am live in front of an audience and i just you know what i mean like there's no thing of, like i just got to go do it and i and like you know even if any time i ever thought like i wasn't in the mood i was like thank god i did it in the end yeah um yeah sure and i think with a lot of things on youtube you just gotta kind of it's not like it encourages you to be brave i think uh and warhammer is a great it's a great conversation starter for most people. Just talked to a handyman earlier. I mean, he hadn't played Warhammer since he was a child, but we talked about it for like an hour. So, you know. <laughs> so he has a little... no, completely, completely wasted his time, but you know what I mean? It was great. <laughs> so what you're saying is he's now locked in your basement tied to a chair and is, you know, being forced to do his first oh, model. Absolutely not. He's in the loft. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things I like to do, at least with a few of these videos, is look through people's model collection or models that they're currently working on. Um, I'm sorry I asked you, because now, you know, it's like... Uh, ooh. I have so many more that I don't have on hand, unfortunately. Okay, no, but, I, uh, I mean, I'm sorry I asked you, because it looks so much better than mine. That's the problem. <laughs> that's, not, that's the only problem. Oh, um, which one do you want to start with? So we're, we've got Magnus, and we've got um, Salamander's... What's the name? Ag Agrax. Ag Agrax. Agatone. Uh, that was it, yeah. Agrax Agatone, yeah. Yeah, so these two are... I mean, we're going to go through all of them, but the, these two are ones that particularly stand out, because I, I love the... I love light work, so mm. um, on Magnus's right hand, obviously he's got got the the, the warp power there, and um, and we are obviously have on Agrix's hammer there, it bleeding onto the rest of the base. Why do you have random models of different armies that you don't collect in terms of salamanders? Like, is it just because? Well, I used down? to I used to play Space Marines, but then with when Tenth Edition released, it wasn't. Like, I wanted the option to play the different detachments. So I had my own generic Space Marine kind of chapter. And then I basically essentially brought in the the unique HQ models for when I wanted to play the uh, different detachments. So okay. it was an actual easier way to, like... Yeah, I, I could paint up a HQ model that I was really invested in. And then I could actually just play... like I, I played most of the detachments at least once. So it was mm. loads of fun. The, the blending of colors is really cool. Like I, I must say, like I, 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 I don't really see Magnus done with that much panache, because even on even on his, and only if you guys can see it on the screen. If you do, then um, if you're watching this on your phone, just wait to get onto your PC, or your laptop. But like the blue highlights along the inner parts of the wings, the, the feathers, you very rarely see somebody going into that much detail in a mod like this because it's exhausting. It's absolutely oh, I... exhausting. You know what's really funny? It's still unfinished. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I I think I've got I have I need to make the base crazy. I had like a forest idea initially, but I need to make it like a Zechian. Um, but just for the audio listeners, I will just slightly describe like the wings slot outside, sort of metallic, then it creeps into like the red, then purples, and a bits of blues in some places. Uh, the metals I did every every kind. There's like there's gold, coppers, and uh, really bright silvers on particularly his shins. Uh, most of that stuff was oil wash and then prior brushed again. I, I, I want to say like, I spent a long time on these models, but like in terms of I, it's taken me ages to do them because it's been such a long time I've had them. Hmm. And I, I usually I find myself like I don't necessarily want to 
finish a model like in one go. I like slowly think same. myself. Yeah. Could keep improving that bit. Uh, yeah, Agrax Agatone was the same thing of it just started out um, more like generic green. And then I picked out the brush and I did like stippling highlights because mm. I saw a video on it. And then I made the his like demon, well, not even has like um his hammer glow. And then I started adding a little more details, like some, you know, getting his skin up to like right level the great the the right level of brightness. On his like chest bit, I did like a blue and red bit. No idea why, I just did it for fun. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, like I even then I could probably still do more on it. It's only it seems like you can never say a model's finished. I have so many other cooler ones, I wish I'd uh <laughs> which I brought them with me. Um, but yeah, I, I feel particularly proud of Magnus, but I feel quite forgiven in terms of how big he is. It's the little, it's the smaller models that are like quite tough. Uh, should, I, should I just explain the rest of them? Is there any sure, sure. To... Like, like, I'm going through all of them. So, so um, I mean, the, the light work, I can tell that you've, so what you've, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you've learned techniques as you've, as you've gone along with the models and then <laughs> come back and then you know, revisited it and, and you can't tell that's what's happened here, but like in certain areas where, like, see, see the Cornet uh, rider there, the um, what's his name? Lord Invocatus. That's it. Yeah. So most people don't pick out that symbol on the side um, because it's corn. You know, it's just who cares? You know. But you can tell that you've gone back and gone. Well, hang on. I've got this technique that I can now do. Is there anywhere on this model where I can put this on? Do you know what I mean? And and um, it is a gorgeous model, actually. Now look at it. It's yeah. Really I, nice. I, I mean, um, just for the audio listeners, I have done my... Is it the juggernaut he's riding on is actually done in brown, which mm. is quite an odd choice, but it's because uh, I want to make the character look even more... Like, in person, actually, it looks very different. Actually, that's one of the... My phone's not the best quality. Um, so in Lord Invocatus himself, he's actually done in metallic purple. And you know the thing where they break, like, Japanese bowls and they re-put it back together with, yeah. like, gold? yeah. It's very hard to see in the model, though. Actually, like he has like, you know, like Night Lords have lightning. He actually has gold lightning over his armor. I can see it. Yeah, uh, it's, very, it's much better in person. But um, mm -hmm. just to show, like he was almost remade in some kind of way. Um, other parts, like even like his helmet is also like red, red eye glow. But then like he has like browns as well because it's such an odd. I thought to myself, I want to do something like really odd in terms of like color. Like you don't really see a model particularly painted in brown a lot of the times. And I wanted to do something a bit different, and then it kind of highlights up to bone, and then it was more the purple choice for the armor for a corn eight uh, berserker. But like, it's really out there, and I, I know a lot of Night Lords players be watching this with a semi on already, with the with the way the colors are blending together. But like, oh yeah, you know, I have um my uh, World Eater army is half metallic purple, half metallic orange, and it looks very <laughs> bizarre. But I really like it just because it's such a like again, it's one of the things on the tabletop. If it's you mostly see things from a distance, um, mm -hmm. but I, as a grouping, it actually looks really like distinct, and no one else quite has that combination. So I really, oh, and also mentioning for the audio listeners, I like the highlights on the Juggernaut. Like his symbols are all in like like ethereal blue, mm -hmm. so brown and blue, not a typical combo, but no. it kind of it looks odd it and pops, it stands though. out. It pops, and the base is I don't know what the. How do you describe the base? It's more like um, tundra. The bases, yeah, so the tundra. Kind of... There's some Valhalla and Blizzard on there with some tufts, but it looks really good. I, I like the dry brushing the technique on it as well. It's good. Really, really good. desaturated compared yeah. to the model. Okay. And then, oh, the next one is uh, Mr. Ferris. <laughs> Mr. Ferris Manus, as he wishes. Um, this is Iron Father Ferios of yep. the Iron Hands, mm -hmm. uh, but actually with the Black Templar uh, helmet. Um, I gave him also a white helmet just to make him stand out a bit more. I this is one of the first ones I did like properly grim dark as a style of it. So it actually is primed in red and then oh. uh dry brushed over in like blacks and then grazed like the sort of highlight. It's one of those things where, like it looks really odd in person because like the shadows are very different um compared to what's like normal black armor. Because I don't really like doing black armor. Mm -hmm. And then his weapon is highlighted up to like a kind of etheric glowing like purple because mm. i think some people have done like purple as like the accent color for iron hands and they're on like a very like ocean underwater like coral base 
because you'd never find like I like the idea of like a grim dark model being on something where it's kind of not grim dark because it looks out of place. He's just approaching um, that singing scene from the Little Mermaid like that. He's just like, all right, yeah, all these heretics. It's, it's are really on. blue. Um, I was particularly happy with the weapon on that one because it came across uh, really well. Uh, that's my first time like doing something like that on a model with like the highlights up to like white. Um, but I was really proud of that one. Uh, then the next one for is, um, well, it's a bit of a hybrid, this one. This is Ariman on disc, but it's not actually Ariman's body. It's Mephiston's body with Ariman <laughs> kitbashed onto him. It's just um, the pose. I, like, I just can't get over it. Yeah, he's like sniffing something. <laughs> um, and like a quick, quick cheeky line on the uh, glove. Um, I like the idea of doing something where um, like because Ariman's normal model is quite like cr crouched over i do have that one but it wasn't like on foot but it wasn't, wasn't like, doing it wasn't doing it for me it's also quite small like it's a little bit smaller than what i feel like a hq model could be and i like the idea of him being like you know who's the most powerful one in the law is it mephiston or is it um Ariman? Mm -hmm. and i like the idea of being like Ariman won and then he possessed mephiston's body <laughs> so i um He's definitely in Mephiston's, you know, armor pecked up body in uh, traditional sort of colors. Although his horns are done in like it's, a. It's mix just that whenever green. somebody mentions him, like I know, you know, the the, mm -hmm. the text to speech device memes, you know, oh yeah, roll eye rolly, but it's just that line of "I'll teach you a fucking lesson" in his voice it just <laughs> always makes me giggle. Uh, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> Trying to get into the Black yeah. Library for like eight thousand years. I was a. Uh, this one was. A, I actually have repainted him almost a couple of times because actually his cape used to be originally orange, but then I went for a white because all my Thousand Suns sorcerers have got like white capes now. Okay. Um, just to make them a bit more better. I like what I did on that one with like the you know the red stripe that goes across his. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I plan to if I ever get more time of it, I might do like scroll work on the cape. Mm. Uh, then I want. To, I need to practice it because I'm not that good at it yet. But mm. I'll give it a go. Um, and that's yeah. I think he actually doesn't. He doesn't even have his original staff. It's the the infernal master staff mm. on his his left hand, which I then put on my infernal master, who looks ridiculously uh, chunk. Um, <laughs> but he's um, and he has like a little glowing hand. Again, like this one is one of the more older ones I did. Is and like it's not as good paint job as a lot of the rest of them. Yeah, but yeah. I do. I'm somewhat proud of that one. Not as proud as the the last one here for people, which was this is actually my friend's model of the Morven Vol. Mm -hmm. And I had seen something on another miniature, which was like Tartan. And I thought that would be so cool on like Sisters of Battle because no I don't know I don't know if anyone's really done that. Hmm. Um and he showed me like a model of like someone who painted up one and he said, Can you do it like that? And I did it as like he wanted, so it's quite more like traditional as in um much more like the normal range of sisters although it's got um it's like up to like gray armor and it's like a blue uh highlighted up weapon and like the red eye glow i wanted a different color but the one he showed me was red um but i really liked the idea of tartan and i remember we actually did a law crime stream with peachy if you obviously know peachy oh yeah, yeah, no, um, peachy, yeah and he we showed him this one and he said he had never seen really someone do it before and he really liked the idea so much he might even make an army of like tartan sisters of battle and i was like oh my god that's brilliant <laughs> that's that, that, i mean by the way if you want to know what a dread knight should look like games workshop um this is what it should look like if we're doing dynamic poses please release be released please yeah. yes the gray knights really need that, that little baby carrier needs help yeah, but it's funny. Yeah. The thing is, like, when it goes away eventually one day, I'll actually be kind of sad because it's kind of iconic. It'll but... become bespoke, yeah. Know. Like a lot of them do. It'll become like one that everybody wants, weirdly, because, you know, it, it's something that's yeah, not like, there anymore, you know. What's crazy, like, most of the models here are somewhat like either like 9th or 10th edition, other than, I guess, I think maybe Magnus was 8th? Yeah. Uh, like, end of 7th, start of, yeah. And so even seven. early, yeah. Like, some yeah. of these. Like they just do come up like with great sculpts for a lot of things. I didn't mm -hmm. really, other than the Ariman one, I've not kit bashed much mm -hmm. on a lot of these ones. I kind of went for what they intended, and I think like people who are, like painting them all at the time or they're doing stuff with the law, like what um, we said here, like 
there's the lore is kind of what you imagine it to be and that's one of the better parts about um this experience of being in warhammer is like it's very much you the ability to craft your own like chapter or story yeah. or like warband yeah. or xenos whatever like there's there's so much opportunity which a lot of other things don't really give you that like i bet even with obviously like some models where you don't really like how it looks i'm like you can always buy another similar model and then turn it into the thing you want it to be hmm. so i almost think like yeah again like with most things like i even now i buy sometimes particularly like for cultists i'm not always happy with the gw range but i may be using things from like warcry to make cultists mm. because i'm like that's so much better oh my god um i do that with stormcast always... as well I, do you know what i, I have conspiracy mm. theory about stormcast actually but um if you're right with me jumping off on that yeah go, 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 go. is that um they i don't think games workshop like this sigmarine thing um because they, they used to be exactly the same size as primaris space marine so they were so easy to interchange so i used a whole lot of them to do my gray knights and they look immaculate look amazing i love them to pieces but the new kits are slightly smaller they're like first ball marine size or smaller even the big heroes are smaller and i think that's done on purpose to make sure that it's like okay you, you now can't use this for that um it's, um, it's more distinct the difference yeah. between the rps yeah exactly yeah yeah. What's, what's weird enough is if you look at um, Age of Sigmar like book covers recently, they're actually much more drawn as grim dark style. So I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Like, yeah. so they still have it. They just realize it's like with most like the modeling team in Age of Sigmar, like they get to cook. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, let, mm -hmm. let us, I beg you, let us have some of those guys because that new Vermin Lord. Oh my god! Oh, give, yeah. me, give me, give oh, me yeah. the Vermin Lord in 40k. In fact, my Vermin Lord may very well be a Mortarian proxy at some point because i need that in my life you know what i mean i'm just gonna put some Atari wings on that thing and let it fly <laughs> i'm so uh i'm so age, age of sigma gets me going in terms of models. Dude, like like the I, models are beyond cool like like literally like i've said this for years like, like the, the best models they do are age of sigma models they're they're bar none like there is no i don't think there's much like, of a debate there it's, it's like an open secret thing, isn't it? Like the people who they consider like the more experimental, like they they want to try different ideas. They usually put them in the AOS team. Mm -hmm. I think that's like that's been known for a while. And again, like they, you know, you know the new Skaven models at the at the time now. Like it just they obviously like they don't really seem to miss. Like I think particularly from the modeling side of it, mm -hmm. a little bit expen too expensive for me. And I think when they realize like how expensive it is for most people, they may be like, ah, you know, they'll they'll. You know, I mean, they're nothing but sale driven. So, uh, if a model's not cool enough to overcome how much money it's worth, then they'll maybe have a sit down and have a conversation. But just to uh, bring us full circle, because you mentioned the Battle of McCrag earlier, uh, one of my mm. earliest memories of the hobby was going in to get uh, a really cool white dwarf to uh, go on a trip down to London, and uh, my grandpa walked in and saw the big Battle of McCrag thing, you know, the big poster. Mm. And he said quite loudly in a packed store, "Battle for my crack," and I was just, yeah, I just, <laughs> yeah, that was. Everyone's looked at oh me, and I was like, God. "All right, let's just get this magazine and go, Granddad." All right, yeah, no problem. Oh my God! Oh, he didn't see it properly. You know, he didn't have his glasses on. He's like, "Battle for my crack." Bloody hell, store you brought me into some. Yeah, just... yeah, my favorite thing is asking my partner who doesn't know really much about Warhammer, like, who is Horrid? And they're like, um, uh... he did something bad. Uh, like, what did he do? I think he stole something. He stole the Emperor. And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, he tried to steal the Emperor. Uh, I can see where she's gone there. I can see where she's gone. Like, I remember, um, oh, one last question before we finish. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Do you have any, so, so one of the things that I, I, the first time I knew YouTube was going all right was when I went to um, my sister's birthday party. And one of her friends, boyfriends, actually voiced Horace on the uh, on the the trailers for Horace Heresy, and did a loads of other things for Games Workshop as well. Um, so I walked in, and, and I'm in there, and, and I'm in the kitchen. And by this time, I've only got like ten thousand subscribers, and he storms in. He goes, "I'm gone. You're Northern Exile." And I was like, "Shit, things are going well." Have you ever had one of those moments when you've been out and about where someone said, "Oh, are you Amber King? Are you you know?" Uh, well, my face is on camera, but I haven't had like a like necessarily to that extent but i have i've had one where it was a friend of my sibling and then 
I was told that they were too nervous to talk to me because they wanted to talk <laughs> about Warhammer with me. And they were like really nervous. What an about honor. It. That, That's cool. I found that hilarious because I was like, bro, I ain't nothing. Like, I, I'm, I'm yeah. the least intimidating person ever. Like, ever. So I found that funny. Um, but nothing quite as in just randomly in public, uh, as in, you know, like in a shop or anything. I don't, hopefully not because they'll, they'll know I, I buy terrible crappy food or something i don't know like they'll they'll like they'll rat me out well i learned that very straight away with bloody green tea when we even started here so there you go but I, I, I did i'm all like i'm I was, i'm getting around to it it's one of those things like isn't it with um the licorice isn't it like salty licorice when the first time you eat it it tastes really bad but you can train your brain to like it I, i'm not gonna lie i'm boggling so, but green tea is kind of I like right. green tea, it just goes straight through me. So when I'm trying to do work, I'm like, okay, I've had one sip of that, time to vacate the premises and, you know, do what I need to do. Um, Drop off the kids. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we, I, I was planning for this episode to be like 45 minutes, you know what I mean? But we're already on Joe Rogan part time. Part two. So like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm going to do it all in one bollocks to it. You can, it'd be a marathon, they can do it themselves. But anyway, um, I will let you go now though, because um, obviously we'll have a little chat afterwards after we finish recording, but uh, cheers of cheers for this man. It's been awesome. And it's, uh, Thank you so they much. say never meet your heroes, but do, because some of them are all right. You know, it's all right. <laughs> I'm no hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you've uh, always wanted to say that. Uh, no, I'm no hero. I'm just, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, just, man. You know oh, I'm, I'm nothing. Don't worry. Just when you, just somebody put that like Homelander yeah. meme there, he's like, you guys are the real heroes. You guys are the real oh. <laughs> All right, man. I'll see you later. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good one. Thank you for listening. <laughs>